Okay, hello and welcome to the live stream for September 26th, 2018. My name is Dana Morningstar and I am the host of this live stream. So if you are new here, welcome. If you are returning here, welcome. This is something that we do every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and it runs for about three hours. So this is a place to both give and get support and ask questions and um, yes. So that's what we do here. So welcome. James, hello. <laughs> he says first. Yes, uh, Deborah, welcome. Mike, Rob, Blue Moon, up yours. Nark, Benjamin, Cynthia, hooray. Hello, hello. So before I forget, we have book club tomorrow night. So that's a discussion that we do every, at the last Thursday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And, oh, here's my book. So the book that we're gonna be discussing tomorrow night is called Facing Love Addiction by Pia Melody. Uh, there's, I have a lot of some, a, a lot to say. <laughs> I have a lot to say about this book. And I think that there's a lot that we can squeeze out and to bring insight to our health and healing. I'll be curious to see what you guys have to say about it. Yes, I agree, Mike. Mike says the CPTSD by Pete Walker book is an amazing book. Absolutely, that's in my top five. If I had to list top five, I would say that book by Pete Walker, um, the Body Keeps the Score is another excellent one as far as like recovery and, and uh, understanding all of this goes. Um, trying to think of like recovery books that have been my top. I, face, there's a lot in this Facing Love Addiction. If you're not familiar with Pia Melody's work, she is, I personally, I find her fantastic. She's got a ton of YouTube videos out there. Uh, she's got a whole book series on a wide variety of topics and she really covers, I think her primary focus is more like uh, codependency in a nutshell. And even if a person doesn't identify as being codependent, which a lot of people don't, uh, there's still a lot that we can squeeze out from her work. She talks a lot about boundaries and uh, kind of attachment and healthy relationships and how all of those pieces fit together. So yeah, Healing the Child Within, that's another good one, C. Finn recommended. Missouri Cowboy, interesting, says, I'm trying to read Pete Walker's book slowly. I'm afraid to pick it up, it's so weird. Mm, just reading the table of contents sent me into a two month dialogue, an insane shouting match with all of my inner critics. That's really interesting. It's, uh, I'd have to go back and reread that book. It's something we read it for book club, like when book club was first getting going and that was like three years ago. So I'd, I'd need to go back and reread it. But I think a lot of these books that really focus on us can be, can be really triggering. Uh, some, I was doing a live stream with Angie Atkinson yesterday and there was a guy on there who'd said kind of, and off topic, but not really, he was saying that he went through his first EMDR session and it triggered his CPTSD so bad that he's had a hard time getting out of bed for the past six weeks. And that I think caught both of us off guard because that was the first time we've heard anybody reporting uh, having such a hard time with EMDR. So it's interesting, all of the stuff that when we start getting into CPTSD and understanding trauma and understanding our trauma responses and piecing things together about uh, kind of why we're attracted to certain people or why we've been reacting in a certain way, it brings a lot of stuff to the surface. And both, interestingly enough, both James and Agata will be on for book club tomorrow. And both of them had told me, they were like, this is a really difficult book. It really triggered me. It's uh, intense. So, and I have to say, I was, I had my own reservations about it. Uh, 
it did bring up a lot. I had a, and I, I had quite a few aha moments from the book, but I think this book in particular, the facing love addiction, if a person is even, I would say like within a year out of being through a narcissistically abusive relationship, this book might be a little, not a little, it might be a lot too soon. So we're going to try to unpack it and make it relevant for a wide variety of people in stages of healing and understanding. <laughs> yeah, James says, wait, three people, Dana? Yes, it'll be me, you, and Agata tomorrow night. And that's a great point. And Missouri Cowboy says, I switched uh, reading the healing, the shame that, oh, I switched and I'm now reading John Bradshaw's Healing the Shame That Binds Again. This time I understand so much more of it. Yes, and that's a great point. Something that is really interesting, especially about self-help books. Well, I think actually any book in general is it what we glean from it changes as we grow and change. And it's really wild because you can read a book. That's why I was just saying, I need to go back and read that, that Pete Walker book because what you take away from it, you know, uh, now versus what you'll take away from it a year from now or five years from now are very different things. It's really wild. And especially for the people that are here. And if you're really digging into personal growth and understanding everything, understanding narcissism and manipulation and abuse and, um, you know, boundaries and standards and deal breakers and all of this stuff, it might, you might not realize how supercharged your personal growth really is because you're so close to it. This is perhaps kind of become your new normal to spend a lot of time on YouTube or reading blogs or books about this topic. But it's really wild when you go back and you're like, oh my goodness, yes. Or even when you see new people come into the chat and you can see a lot of the questions that they have that the old you had even from six days ago, you know, it's just amazing how quickly people get caught up to speed with all of this. Once they understand kind of, this is the puzzle that we need to put together. And these are some of the pieces. So it's book club is always interesting. And um, that's a good point. Cynthia says, yes, it's like getting a university degree where everything builds on another. Absolutely. And okay, interest. Okay, Heather says yes. She was reading Pia Melody's book on facing codependency, and she started reading the workbook Breaking Free. And I had to stop because it was very emotional and just too much. Yeah, I could see that. Her book. She is very matter of fact with her approach and the way that she addresses addresses all of this and. You know, really depending on where a person is in their healing and understanding, it can definitely feel like victim blaming and it can be very triggering. And um, my experience with it when I first discovered her work is I was more confused than anything else. <clears throat> a lot of the terminology, I guess just kind of in psychology in general about like abandonment and these kinds of things, I had, I really struggled with identifying with that. So I was like, well, I don't know if I'd say I was like abandoned, like that seems pretty, you know, extreme. And so I was very quick to write off a lot of material that I think really would have been helpful because I just wasn't understanding the terminology. And so I think books, especially the PML, Melody, her stuff is just packed full of stuff. I think it really does help to discuss it and be able to unpack it and to see, I think it's just helpful to see what other people pull out of certain material and issues they had or aha moments they had. And I agree, Healthy Love says yes, it's gonna be a, a good talk from, from both a male and female perspective. Yeah, I agree. It's It'll be nice to have a, a guy perspective in here for sure. Mm. Healthy Love says, I didn't feel victim blamed, but I felt confronted. Yeah, she just lays it all out. And 
uh, yeah, I think depending on where a person is in their healing and understanding, they can either feel victim blamed or or that confrontation of her work can cause a person potentially cause a person to have an aha moment. I think that's another one of the challenges with all of this is it's so dependent upon where that person is and what can give one person an aha moment and lead to this amazing breakthrough can completely shut another person down. And it's, it's hard to know how a person's going to respond to certain material. And, um, but again, I think that's the benefit of the group and, and all of us kind of going through this. Gareth, welcome. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Mike was saying, Pete Walker's book says, recovery can take years, but I've been practicing self-love, subliminal affirmations, expressing emotions, and reading that book for like a week straight, and I already feel results. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm excited for you. That's, that's huge. And there's so many different tools that we can use to achieve those results. I was watching a YouTube video today and I, it wasn't even related to this topic. And I wish I even remember what it was, what it was about. Uh, it was a short video and uh, the guy was talking about, you know, basically we have kind of this early programming. It's, kind of thought that, you know, the first six or seven years of our life, like that's where a lot of our original programming is installed for lack of a better term. And then as we, you know, from ages eight onward, we're, we're basically just acting out of those programs. And so then there's generally a pain point like that, that might work for us for a while. But I think when people kind of hit about the age of 25, you know, 35 ish, things start to break down and then they start seeking help or seeking answers of like why this is. And, and sometimes it can take, a person can really, you know, go through life trying to keep everything together and they might not have this level of awareness or insight that there's a major problem until, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. But when that level of, of insight does happen, then the way that we can change that, because we can't change that early programming, but we can update it kind of like a computer. So we can add additional programming. And one of the ways that we can do that is through hypnosis or uh, affirmations, uh, these kinds of things. And so anyway, so this video that I was talking about how, um, you know, we have this original programming and then as we get older, we can start learning this new programming and the way that we have to learn it now because when you're a child, you're almost, you know, you're, you, you just absorb everything around you, but as an adult, it takes a lot more work. And so it's basically, we basically learn through repetition and in practice is a big thing. So knowing something is very different than actually doing something. And I think one of the best ways that we can see it, like, are we really picking up on these things is to look at the results that we're getting in our life. And if we're seeing changes in our behavior, you know, then, then it's really exciting. Cause yeah, then we're on a, a different trajectory. So. Uh, Shoshana says, Dana, hi, I've just recently subscribed to your channel. I'm 36 days, no contact with my narcissist after seven years. Good for you. That's huge. That's huge. Thank you for everything. You are so very welcome and welcome here and yay for this exciting next chapter in your life. <laughs> Demetria says, James, I saw you yesterday. I can't wait until you go live again. Yes. So if you caught that, the video was only up for about 20 minutes. James and I were testing out just the connection and he was wanting to kind of see like, how was all of this going to work? And so we ended up going live. We did a test video. I deleted it, uh, but we did a test video and I was trying to explain like, you know, 
here's how everything works. So we had quite a few people hop on during our test chat, which uh, I don't know, it was it was entertaining. <laughs> okay, let's see, let me scroll down here. New Life says, uh, yes, these small victories can make all of the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you, Rob. I'm glad that these videos can help. And it's like this community is is just amazing. It really, really is. He says, this channel and your work has put it all in perspective. I'm so grateful. And thanks for this amazing resource and helpful community. Yes, you are so very welcome. I, you know, I think about this often and <laughs> this is probably something I should acknowledge on a more regular basis, but I'm continually surprised as to, and I don't want to jinx myself, but how smoothly everything runs. You know, um, here and in the support groups, like it's just amazing because you have, you know, in these situations, you have a bunch of people, the vast majority of them, I would say, are absolutely raw with emotional pain. They're very easily triggered. They're scared. They're confused. Um, they're very emotional. And you would think that that would just lead to all kinds of problems on a regular basis. And I am just always blown away, like how for the, I mean, the vast majority of the time, like how amazing and supportive and just wonderful people can be. And I had so many hesitations, you know, with, we have 111 people on right now. You know, there's 53,000 something in the support group. Like there's that, that many people can get together and, and it goes smooth. So thank you guys for that. And I, I just hope that you can acknowledge that too. Like that's such an, an I think that speaks volumes about you guys and um, the desire to heal and just who you are as people and the supporting of each other and all of it. It's just, it's awesome. <laughs> awesome to see. Yes, I agree. Dwayne says the reason it goes smoother is because the vast majority of hit bottom and understand each other's pain. Yeah. And Cynthia says, we are just so thankful to have a place to make changes after years of not having anything like that. Yeah, I hear you. And it's, um, I think that is almost one of like the beautiful things about being in this level of pain is it makes us, it, it like widens our understanding of other people and, and make, can make us, it can allow for us to become more compassionate because we understand this and people that haven't been through this just don't get it. And so there is kind of this camaraderie of like, I get you and I'm sorry for what you went through. Like, that's not, you didn't deserve that, you know? And just the amount of people that are here to give support. And if you're not, if you're listening to this live stream on as a podcast or um, after the videos aired, it's such a different experience because in the chat, there's so many people that are answering each other's questions and just giving support and validation. And it's just really cool. So... Okay, let's see. Let me scroll up here. Kiara asks, Dana, how do we deal with people who try and limit us based on their own understanding? I'm following my dreams and doing what's best for me, and I feel good, but those around me keep telling me I will fail. Well, this is a common thing, and there's that whole analogy, if you've, if you've ever heard of the whole crabs in a bucket kind of a thing where crabs, if you, uh, is it crabs? It's crabs, right? Crabs in a bucket. Like if you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket and one starts to try to crawl out, the others will pull him back down. And people are very much that same way. We're kind of uh, hardwired to not like change. And not only do we resist change within ourselves, but we can find it threatening when other people start to change as well. 
because I think deep down, we know that the nature of our relationship with them is going to change that um, it, and it can be a reflection of, oh my goodness, they're out living their dream and here I am not living mine. And so there can be kind of all kinds of like different subconscious things at play when other people try to drag you down. And, you know, it can help, I think, to just realize that when other people are doing that, when either they're tearing you down or they're dragging you down, they're responding to you through the the lens of their own issues. And so this isn't about you, it's about them. And it can help to distance yourself from people like that. It can help to just realize, okay, who, who is truly supportive of me and who is in my, who is emotionally safe? Because as you grow and change, odds are your inner circle is going to grow and change. And maybe it's not your complete inner circle, but there's probably going to be a lot of people in there that you're just not going to have a whole lot in common with anymore. And you're going to meet new people that you do have a lot more in common with and, and, and on and on it goes. And so that's part of growth is the beginning of something new and the ending of something old. And if people, you know, aren't supportive and they're not emotionally safe, if you're opening up about your hopes and your dreams and they're telling you all of the, the reasons this won't work or all of the, the concerns they have, or if they're trying to, um, kind of plant seed the doubt and insecurity in you, you know, then there comes a point where I think you just have to realize, okay, I'm, this is not, a, there's no point in having this conversation. Like this just isn't going anywhere. So you just quit having, you just quit talking about stuff like that. And that's why with them. And so that's why people start finding, they start seeking out other people that are like them. Um, and Here's the thing too about having dreams, especially if you have unconventional dreams. You know, if you're, it's a lot easier to get support if you're kind of do, you're going with the flow. You're doing what society tells you that you need to do. You need to get a nine to five job and, you know, you should have a certain type of house or a certain type of car or a certain type of job or spouse or whatever. And if you're not going that direction, other people don't understand it. So a lot of this has to do with us basically growing stronger dreams and just realizing that not everybody's going to understand your path and that's okay. Like there's, it's a waste of time for us to try to convince them that what we're doing is okay. And if their input is really rattling you to where you're like, I don't know, maybe they're right. That kind of stuff. It's time to go seek out people that have done what you want to do and learn from them. It's, I think it's always helpful to find a mentor or mentors that are successful in the areas that you want to be successful in. So like, if you want to be an artist, go find some successful artists and, you know, see if, ask them, like, you know, can you tell me like what worked for you and what didn't work for you? And how are you able to do this as a living and, and learn from people that are doing it. But yeah, there's not going to be any time in life where all the lights are green and everybody's going to be 100% supportive of you. Everything in life is going to be in line. That's just, that really just doesn't happen. And Don says, yeah, it's what I'm doing with my father. Yeah. And I think it's what a lot of people <laughs> have had to do with, with parents, especially that just don't understand. Uh, sure. TDZ asks, can you elaborate on the respond versus react? Like maybe a simple example. Yes. So when, when we react, a person says, especially if they're pushing buttons, right? They say something and we, we become reactive. So let me think of an example. Um, okay. We'll use the dream example, right? So somebody is, let's say your dad says, well, you know, that'll never happen. You've never, uh, you know, I just, I just don't think that'll happen. And then your normal reaction is, God, you know, you get really upset. And you're like, this is so, why can't you just support me? And I don't understand and blah, 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 blah. Right. That's being reactive. Being responsive is where we're able, and it helps, it helps to be able to anticipate somebody's behavior to the best that we can. So if you're kind of locked in this dance where 
you've got a person in your life that doesn't support what you're doing, yet you continue to bring up the thing that they don't, they've consistently not supported you in, you know, and it never goes well, then it, it would, it's a mistake to think that it's someday it's, it's going to go well. Like there's, there's nothing in their behavior that's pointing to that this is going to change. So acknowledge, like, accepting that this is just how it is. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not okay, but it just, it is, it is what it is. So knowing that if you can anticipate then being responsive means you either, you change your approach in some sort of way. So you don't become emotionally reactive. And when, when we shift our power into being uh, responsive to other people and to situations, that's when you really start re kind of reclaiming your power. You're responding in um, a much more like mod moderate way. And that it allows you to kind of keep peace in your life and just detach from kind of needing needing to, to get validation from them or to get them to see things your way or any of that. Like you just detach. It is what it is. You know, otherwise it's Lucy and Charlie Brown playing football. Like Lucy promises to hold the football. Charlie Brown runs up to go kick it. She pulls it away, laughs hysterically. And every single time he asks, are you sure you're not going to do it this time? Are you sure you're going to hold the football? She's like, oh yeah, absolutely. And then she pulls it away. And we have to, in order to break that cycle, you know, we have to anticipate somebody's behavior and then take different action. New Life says, I'm actually grateful for everything that has happened despite all the pain because I have grown more as a person in the last couple of years than in all of the many years before. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, when they get to a certain point in healing and everybody's time frame is different for that. Um, and of course, too, depending on like what they've been through, but they can get to a place where they can reflect and be like, oh my goodness, I have had so much personal growth that I just don't think would have happened any other way. Like it really took me hitting this emotional rock bottom for me to make a lot of these realizations. And the book Facing Love Addiction is, you know, but depending on where a person is, like it's full of a lot of aha moments. Mm, that's a great question. Kiara says, Dana, how do we know whether we are responding or being passive? I've been so detached from my emotions that reacting feels proper. It feels like I care if I'm being mistreated. Help. That is a fantastic insight. So when we, okay, so let's, let's break this down because you bring up a lot of good points here. When we're responding to somebody or either... We're, we're basically, we're either being assertive and bringing up our concerns or we're being solutions oriented. And even if we're being assertive, the goal is to be solutions oriented. But sometimes if, if you're caught up in that Lucy, Charlie Brown cycle, Char, you know, Charlie Brown is being assertive. He's at, being very direct. Lucy, are you promised that you're going to hold the football again? I really don't like it when you pull it away. I land flat on my back. It really hurts. It's no fun. Like, why can't we just play football? Like he's being direct, he's being assertive, but it's not changing the outcome. So what's going on there isn't miscommunication. It's that they're playing, they're doing this dance. They both have their own end goal. Charlie Brown is just trying to have fun. He wants to play football. He wants to play kick the ball. Lucy wants to play the game of pull the ball away. And so once we realize that we're in a dynamic like this where we're not focused on the same solution as the other person for whatever reason, they're trying to get us to see things their way, or they're trying to continually manipulate or what have you. Then the only solution that can be reached is to just dis disengage and do something completely out different. So like for Charlie Brown, the solution would be, I'm not going to play football with Lucy anymore. That's not him being passive. That's him accepting for whatever reason, Lucy is sadistic and she's just, she's manipulative. She's not a friend. 
She pretends to be a friend. She acts friendly, but she's not a friend. She keeps hurting me and she thinks that's funny and I'm done. So um, responding comes from a place of being assertive or solutions oriented. Uh, reacting is okay. So what you're talking about, when a person has been detached for their emotions for so long, when they have been people pleasing, when they've just numbed out to all of the pain and the hurt and, and all of that, they where what you're describing is a very normal stage. And I think boundary development where a person um, really does become very reactive. And so, and that can feel really good because it's like, man, I'm really setting people straight. I'm letting them know exactly how I feel. That tends to be an extreme. And so when we're being assertive, when we're being solutions oriented, when we're setting boundaries with people, like that more you know, moderate middle ground there is to be able to do so in a tactful, like a constructive solutions oriented way, not in a gruff, I'm going to stick it to you. I'm going to um, lash out at you and set you straight kind of a way. It's just there. It's not done with anger. It's done with assertion kind of a thing. And so that's learning how to kind of moderate our understanding, our understanding, our emotions and the way that our emotions express themselves, if that makes sense. So it takes a little while. It's kind of like, you know, like the term getting your sea legs, you know, when you're out on the water, it takes a little while to figure out how to stand on the boat without falling over. And learning any new skill is like that. It just takes a little bit. And it's common for people to oftentimes do too much or too little. Uh, and another common thing with boundaries is some people will do uh, instead of, they, they'll go from no boundaries and then they have this realization of, oh my goodness, I haven't had any boundaries. I didn't realize I should have boundaries. I've been told my whole life that having boundaries is somehow selfish or bad. And then, they, then they're like, well, I'm changing that starting today. And then they swing to the opposite, the, the polar opposite, but the polar opposite of no boundaries isn't boundaries. The polar opposite of no boundaries is fortressing. It's setting up walls. And so then they really become you know, kind of this zero tolerance, um, very reactive, uh, just, you know, place of, uh, they're missing the, the moderation piece of it. And that's the learning to be assertive and, and all of that. So it's just, it's normal. So thank you, Dwayne, for the live stream donation. I appreciate it. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, so TD says, so the response is non-emotional, but how does that translate to the response with just becoming apathetic? Okay, so I, let me make sure I understand the question correctly. So if we're responding, are you saying, so we're responding in a non-emotional way, but not becoming apathetic. So we still care. We still care. We still have feelings, right? Like you still might have anger and hurt feelings and all of these feelings there. If I guess here's how I look at it. If we're bringing up our feelings with another person, it's it would only be to kind of deepen the level of connection within that relationship. So if, again, the Charlie Brown, Lucy example, the only way that, that Charlie Brown will be set free is if he understands that there is no friendship with Lucy present, that he's been stuck in this fantasy that she's been fueling with false promises of change, right? But to understand Lucy is not a friend and uh, me expressing my emotions isn't getting anywhere. If anything, she finds it even funnier because she's playing a totally different game. So if you're gonna bring up your emotion, if you're gonna be vulnerable and say like, you know what, this is really concerning to me. This really hurts my feelings, this, that, and the other. It helps, it's important, not even it helps. It's important that, that, that 
that person's emotionally safe. So for example, if we're talking about being very direct with a manipulative or abusive person in our life, and we're like, you know, th this really hurts my feelings, or um, I, I'm just not okay with this, or this, that, and the other, that might just make things worse because they're not looking for a solution. They're looking, they're looking to win. And the more we, we give them, so there's two different types of realities out there, two different types of mindsets as far as this goes. You've got solutions-oriented people, and then you have domination-driven people. If we're talking about like pathological personalities, or if we're talking about a highly manipulative person, you're not dealing with somebody that's solutions-oriented. So if you're dealing with somebody that's domination-driven, like Lucy, and they're continually trying to get their way, it's important that we realize you're, you're not dealing with somebody that has the same reality. And when we do that, we need to be able to then change our and how we approach them and what we share with them and our expectations of them and all of that. But you can still feel how you feel. It just might not get you very far to express that to them, but it's okay. You know, if you've got a coworker or a boss that's domination driven uh, and is making your life a living hell and you're trying to, you know, get projects done, these kinds of things, it's OK to get in your car during lunch or to drive home and just scream and rant and rave and and feel the way that you feel or to journal about it or to get out all of those that frustration um, it's normal and human and healthy to be frustrated at a frustrating situation. So it's like walking that line of like acknowledging how you feel, but we don't necessarily have to express it. And we, we probably shouldn't express it to people that are emotionally unsafe, if that makes sense. Oh, thank you, Gray Rock. It's great to see you here. Um, and thank you for the live stream donation. Alex says, hey, Dana, a couple months ago, you helped me realize that my ex was a million miles away from ever being able to take responsibility for the damage he did and continues to do. And something just clicked. Well, I'm glad that I was able to play some sort of part in helping you get the clarity that you were needing. I think that's one thing about the truth is we tend to know what it is by the way that it feels. And there is just this moment where it clicks and you're like, yeah, yeah. So um, I will say though, with, with my channel and I think channels like this, um, we, we tend, whatever I'm saying it might provide aha moments for you, but I just want to, I guess I just want to bring to your awareness that it's basically reflecting back to you everything that deep down you already know. And I think that's really important because, and we'll talk about this tomorrow more in the book club, but um, I think it's just that awareness of your own inner wisdom and, uh, that you have so many of the answers deep within you and, and you know, you know it when you hear it. Hi, Sam. Yes, I was actually just thinking about you with the, the coworker issue. Yeah, stuff is just crazy making. Okay, let's see. Let me scroll up there. Mike, okay, that was the question I was looking for. He says, will the CPTSD healing take a really long time? Here's the thing with healing is, and a lot of people get tripped up on this. I know I've covered this before. So if you've heard me um, talk about this, I, I just feel like it's worth repeating, especially for the newer people here. I think one of the biggest barriers to healing is that people tend to think that healing means going back to the way that they were. And if you can release that understanding of healing and understand that healing is, is 
not about going back to who you were. It's about, it's about becoming somebody new. And so like, who are you going to be in this next chapter of your life? It's much like if we have, uh, you know, if you get cut on your arm and that skin grows back, it heals, but it's different, right? It's now scar tissue. And the thing with that, so even though it's not the way that it used to be, it's actually stronger than it was before. Scar tissue is much stronger than regular skin. And so healing from trauma of any kind, if we can develop and really cultivate and steer into like that growth oriented mentality, then we can become so much more resilient and stronger and compassionate and self-aware. And like, there's so many positive things that we can squeeze out of this to become kind of, uh, you know, Mike 2.0. So to become like the next, the highest and greatest version of yourself. So I would encourage you to not try to get overwhelmed with everything that's involved in healing. It's more, it might not feel like it right now, but it truly is a journey and it's an, it can be an, an adventure. It's self discovery. Like you've never thought possible and it can be absolutely life-changing And not just the way that with the people that you date, it's across the board with the way you understand, like Sam is experiencing the way you understand and relate to coworkers, the way that you understand your own behavior, that of course the choices in partners, the choices in friends, um, everything, (laughs) like everything, boundaries and standards and deal breakers and And not, like I was saying, not just in relationships, across the board. And Tony Robbins once said, you know, if you really want to change your life, change your standards. And that's a big part of of healing. And so it's self-esteem, it's self-care, it's self-awareness, it's just everything across the board. It just supercharges, supercharges you. So... Yeah. You won't be the same person when you're on the other side of this, but you're not meant to be. That's the thing. You're not meant to be. Life is always about growth. It's never about going back to the way we were. Oh, good. Shaw says, oh, I'm so glad I just heard that. Thank you. I always thought of it as becoming who I used to be but still I'm a little buried by all the negativity I experienced from others. Yes. And, and I think that, I think a lot of myself concluded, like uh, that trips up a lot of people when they're healing because they get so upset. They're like, when, when am I going to be back the way I was? When am I going to trust, you know, virtual strangers completely? And, and why can't I just take people at face value? And, and why can't I just love like I've never been hurt? And why, uh, you know, I, I view the world so differently and we can feel so profoundly broken because of that. But the reality is it, there's, we're more seasoned we understand like what's out there. And so our whole understanding of the world and people in it and other people's behavior and our own behavior, all of this, it's like a bomb goes off. It like radically changes the landscape. And so a big part of healing is looking around and realizing I need to put things back together differently, you know, because I can't put them back the same. I don't like there's a lot of pieces to put back together. And so when you're reassembling your life, you're making that conscious decision to choose the pieces that you rebuild with. And I'll tell you a lot of trust is a big one for so many people because they get hung up myself included. They would get hung up on why can't I just trust, take people at face value. I will tell you the vast majority of people out there have the mindset of, I will trust people completely until they give me reason otherwise. And that is a really naive mindset to have. And it gets, and it might work for them. It might work for them their whole life, but if it doesn't work, it can go really bad, really fast. You people, and it's not just with relationships, people that get tangled up in cults or with scammers like Bertie Madoff or 
um, you know, people like Bill Cosby, like there's all kinds of manipulative, dangerous people out there. And so it's healthy that we have a healthy degree of skepticism. And we realize that trust is not something that's freely given. It's something that's earned and making that shift instead of like, I'm just going to take everybody for face value and love like I've never been hurt and just be so quick to give people trust that haven't earned it. Uh, and then realize, okay, that's, that's not the best way to go about things. Instead, I'm going to just have healthy boundaries. Like I'm not going to meet a stranger at their house or in a you know park or a deserted place. Like I'm just going to go slow. I'm going to tune into me and what I'm comfortable doing. I'm going to set the pace and other people might tell you, and this is an added layer of the crazy making is they'll say like, Oh, well, you've got issues, you know, your ex really hurt you, this, that, and the other. And they might try to intentionally, unintentionally plant seeds of doubt in you that you're doing the wrong thing. But I will tell you, it's, it's immature to go about with this kind of childlike naivety and just instantly trusting other people. Um, And here's the thing too, when, When we go slow and we're tuning in, we're just in alignment. Like we're tuning in to our instincts about other people. And we know, we know how a problematic situation and person feels. It feels like something's off. When, when your radar starts going off, it's, that's a sign. It's a sign to just take a few steps back and you set the pace all the time. This is what healthy people do. So it's not that it's a, you know, we were healing from abuse and this is why we're doing it. It's just what healthy people do. If somebody makes a strange request, if somebody says something that feels a little bit off, realizing it doesn't matter what other, other people might disagree with you. They might think that you're being hypervigilant or rude. That's okay. Let them think whatever they're going to think. Like you do l- listen to your instincts and set the pace. And here's the other thing with trust is once you, um, are in alignment, like with your instincts and how problematic situation feels. And, and you have the tools in your toolkit with like being assertive and setting boundaries and kind of disengaging from certain conversations and certain people. And you've gotten rid of that need for concrete proof. That's another big one is you realize I don't need to wait for them to prove me right. That it's, if something feels off, if it's causing me perpetual confusion and mental anguish, that's enough of a reason for me to pull back because my mental, my safety and my sanity matter. And I just, and part of sanity is not going through ongoing mental anguish or perpetual confusion. So when we get rid of that need for concrete proof and we realize, Hey, you know what? Like, I just don't do drama or crazy making or any of this. Like if it's, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no kind of a thing. And when we make that shift, we're starting to learn to trust ourselves. And when you can learn to trust yourself, to keep yourself safe, to keep yourself safe, it takes so much of the pressure off of other people to act a certain way. And it's so much easier to start cultivating trust with them because then we're not hoping. We're not like, oh, I really hope this person doesn't turn out to be abusive or, you know, verbally abusive, emotionally or physically or, or what have you. It's like, they're going to, they're, we'll find out in time. Like they're going to be whoever they're going to be. And that's okay. You're going to be fine. You can handle this and you're going to respond appropriately. You know, we're not going to go, we're not doing that again, where we get hooked in and then we get dragged through hell. So we don't have to place all of our power with them, needing them to, to, treat us right. It just, it, it's just a very different way of understanding the world. Uh, okay. Let's see. Oh, thank you, Jamie, for the live stream donation. She says she or he, I'm not sure. Jamie (laughs) says, thank you, Dana. You're so very welcome. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And that's a great point, truth seeker. And this is one of my favorite things because this tends to be such an entry point. Like 
aha moment for people is truth seeker was saying that they don't have to be narcissists or diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder to be the wrong energy for you. And that's okay. And that's, I just love that when people question that when they're like, but how do I know if they're really a narcissist or not? Or how do I know for sure? And I get it. It can be confusing, but here's the thing is this kind of behavior, problematic behavior comes across in a wide variety of different ways. And because we, and we can talk about, you know, common ways that it comes across, but we can't hit every single thing. And here's the thing, even if we could hit every single thing as like, as we level up in our level of awareness and understanding, so do they. So they're continually, the game is continually changing. So the, the best, the most effective tool that you have in your toolkit is your instincts in tuning into yourself. It's so much, it's it really, truly, it, I know it can bring a lot of like aha moments and awareness to understanding narcissists and manipulation and sociopaths and these kinds of things. But the game changer is an understanding yourself. You have instincts. Everybody has instincts. That you're, it's just part of being human, just like animals have instincts. And it, I know when you go through something that's traumatic, it can feel like your internal compass is all wonky. Like somebody took a magnet to it. And like, now you're like, I don't know which way is North. It can take a little while to get your footing and to find your true North again. But you know, your inner self knows that, that those instincts never, ever go away. It's just us learning to get in tune with them and to not be derailed by other people with well-intended bad advice and um, who don't understand because they haven't gone through this. And so they have a very different understanding of the world, which, you know, again, like people like that got tangled up with Bernie Madoff. There's probably a lot of them that never got tangled up with a manipulative or abusive person up until that point, you know, and now they're 67 years old and they've lost everything. So, and now they're probably, I would imagine going through the same thing of like, I don't, I'm having trouble trusting people. I'm feeling hypervigilant. I feel shame. I feel, I can't trust myself. Like, I, you know, all of that, that's a very common response to a very abnormal situation. So um, yeah, learning to tune into that because, and people tend to start off with asking that question of, are they a narcissist or aren't they? Cause they don't want, it's, I think a lot of times that question, there's different mode, like internal motives people have for asking that. And I think one of the more common ones is they don't, um, they're basically asking, well, if this person's a narcissist, then they can't change. But if they're not a narcissist, if they're just a deeply problematic person with a ton of like really, you know, relationship destroying behavior, then maybe they can change. And the the big aha moment in that is, okay, this is a sign. This is a timeout. We need to get clear about like boundaries and standards and deal breakers. And because like it, getting that label, getting that understanding that you know, the person's a narcissist or not can be very validating, but even finding that clarity uh, is oftentimes really difficult because you can ask 10 different mental health professionals and get 10 very different answers. So, you know, the odds of you getting an official diagnosis is very slim and there's multiple reasons for that as well, but it's, it's difficult to actually get an answer that, that piece of the puzzle, that clarity. So it truly is about kind of getting clear of like, why, what are we tolerating in our life and why? And then kind of the next stage of that question people want to know is, can I be friends with my ex or can I be friends with this abusive or toxic person? And then that tends to lead to kind of like this next wave of of awareness of questioning, like, what is your definition of a friend? And then that it's like pulling a string on a sweater and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, a lot of people have been going through life and they're like, well, yeah, I mean, we're friendly. And they've been confusing a person being friendly with them actually being a friend. Like Lucy is not a friend to Charlie Brown, right? So friends aren't abusive or manipulative or sadistic. 
to each other. Like that's, that's not okay. And so then getting clear about like, wait a minute, like let's examine who's in my inner circle. And then that kind of maybe leads to like the third wave of awareness about examining who is in our inner circle and why. Because so many of us, due to all kinds of reasons, maybe due to, to um, family obligation or understandings about commitment and relationship and friendships and all kinds of things, we probably have a lot of people in our inner circle that are there because they're related to us or we've known them for a very long time or because we're married to them and we feel that they should be in our inner circle or there are children and, you know, like we just feel like they should be. And if we're not putting people in our inner circle, the people should be in our inner circle based off of their behavior, not based off of DNA, not based off of how long we've known them for, not based off of our relation to them. It's how are they treating you? If a, you know, sociopaths have family too. So just because somebody's family doesn't mean that they automatically get a spot in your inner circle. You know, if they're, if they're supportive and then there's different rings, like it doesn't have to be so kind of like cut and dry, either they're in your circle or they're out of your life. Like there can be different circles. Like you have, you know, your inner circle for people that are, that you trust. These are the people that you would call if you needed to talk or you were really stressed out or they were the ones that are supportive of you. Like they've earned that spot in there with appropriate behavior. They've proven that they're trustworthy, that they're on your side, that they're a part of your team. And then you have kind of these outer rings, you know, you have a a circle for um, like acquaintances would be like probably two, well, one or two rings back, right? And then you've got a ring for, I don't know, let's say coworkers or like work friends. And then you have a ring for maybe like people that, you you know, you would say hi if you saw them at the store. Like they're not even really acquaintances. Like they're just people that you know in passing. And then you have the ring for people that are total strangers. And then here's the other thing is here's the ring for total strangers, right? Like here's your inner circle. Here's the ring for total strangers the ring that people go in when they've broken your trust and they've proven to you through their behavior that they cannot be trusted, that they're not on your team, that they're even further out than a total stranger. A total stranger is neutral. Like you don't know if they can be trusted or not. Time will tell, right? But a person that's shown that they are not on your team, like they need to really be several rings outside of your inner circle. And we get, all our lives get all kinds of twisted and tangled up if we've got the wrong people in the wrong seats and the wrong circles. So making a conscious concerted effort to examine like who is in my inner circles, because like we were talking about earlier, as you grow and change, so will every part of your life and especially your these different circles. People will move closer into your inner circle and people will move farther away out of your inner circle. And that's that's growth. Like that's normal and natural. Yeah. Rob was saying, yep. Examine those inner circles. Okay. Let's see. Rick is saying, uh, does anyone find that their brain just does not work some days? Like it's off or you're just on autopilot. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I think this kind of goes back to having compassion for yourself. And it's, it's okay. Like not everybody has a, a, a really great day every single day. And that's okay. Like some days I, there was a day, was it last week or so I haven't had a totally down day in like a really long time where I was like, I'm just done. Like my circuits are fried. I just need to stay in bed and just watch movies and I'm just not going to do anything. I'm not, I might not even shower. I don't even know if I showered that day. Like I literally just did not get out of bed. I wasn't even thinking about anything. I was just having, I was just worn out and, and that's okay. It's okay to have days like that where you're like, you know what, just, there's not going to, not a lot's going to get done. (laughs) Like, well, the house is not going to get clean. I'm not going to get clean. We might be having pizza for the next three meals. Like, it's just, 
and that's that's okay. You just got to work within kind of where you are and be compassionate with yourself. I mean, if you've if you've been through abuse of any kind, you've been through a lot. And um, it's okay to to hunker down and, and take care of yourself and to make that a priority. Okay, let's see here. Um, oh boy, that's a good point. Amal says, people should also be careful with siblings they haven't grown up with. My elderly father instructed his younger sister to manage the finances for a new home construction and she embezzled $50,000. Wow, that's awful. That's just heartbreaking, my goodness. I, I think you bring up a really great point. I've seen this, I've experienced um, this part, not, not the embezzlement part, but like uh, it's, it's amazing how quickly and easily our boundaries can be dropped. So if you've had, if anybody else has had this experience on Facebook, where people might contact you that have the same last name as you. And they're like, oh my, and it's kind of fun, right? People are like, oh my goodness. Like I'm, you know, family, uh, we must be related. We have the same very unusual last name and uh, there's only so many of us. And you know, I bet we're family. And if you're ever out this way, come visit me or I'm gonna be in your area. Like, you know, in the old me, what this is so embarrassing to admit the old me would have been like, Oh, you should come stay with me. My boundaries boom, would have just instantly been dropped. And I would have assumed the best. And I just, it would not have even been on my radar to think that somebody could actually be a problematic person. So the new me, okay, this is actually a good example. I'm going to keep going with this because I think it shows how other people would react to this as well. The new me would be like, Oh, that's so cool. We have the same last name. I, you know, I bet you're right. I bet we are related. Uh, yeah. You know what, if you're in town, I would love to get together for a cup of coffee and let me know where you're staying and we can meet at a local uh, big B or whatever for a cup of coffee. And the new me, and here's the thing, a lot of other people might be like, Oh, well, they're family. You should have them come stay with you. And I can't believe you wouldn't offer that. I mean, where I'm from, family just does everything. And you just, you know, you're just very accommodating and you set up the guest bedroom and you, you know, do all these things. And then when people, other people say that, it can really make us feel like maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe I am being hypervigilant and so on. So here's another example of kind of along the same lines. So Airbnb. If you guys are familiar with that website, I have some good friends of mine who love to go stay in Airbnbs around the world. And they like it when there's a host on site. And so then they can meet new people and stay under the same roof with total strangers. And I am not okay with that at all. Like I will never do that. I just think that's a terrible idea. And um, I just, no, <laughs> like, no. And they have gotten on me a couple times now. Oh, you're just, you know, you're missing out. We've met some really great people. And I'm like, you know what? I've heard some of your stories. And a few of these stories could have really ended badly. And I have no, I, if I'm on vacation, I want to have fun. Like, I don't want to worry about this like unknown variable that is this total stranger. Like, what if they're pervy? What if, I don't know, like, what if they're weird? What if, what if they're, just obnoxious. Like, I don't want to deal with that. So I don't, but the old me would have internalized that and felt like there was something wrong with me. If I didn't immediately trust, if I didn't, if I wasn't doing what they were doing. So I think it's good for us to kind of question these things and learn to, to get more solid in your thoughts and opinions about things. It's okay for things to not be okay with you. <laughs> Nikki says, I don't even want my family in my home. I'd have better luck with a stranger. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me 
Let me scroll up here. Mm, okay, abuse free. Good question. Abuse free says, hi, Dana. You've mentioned this in the past and I'm experiencing this and I'm getting very tired. I'm wondering how to manage this better. I'm finding abusive behavior everywhere after understanding abuse. And everything that you're describing is 100% normal. So let's just start there, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a normal stage in awakening where we start learning what's been going on and you just see the world through this whole different lens. And to people that haven't gone through this awakening, they view it as, oh, you're being hypervigilant or uh, you're dysregulated because of the abuse. And that might be part of it, but a larger part of it is odds are you're seeing problematic behavior clearly for the first time ever. And that feeling of, oh my goodness, I'm starting to see things, like I'm, I see manipulation everywhere. It's terrifying, um, especially, and it can be very invalidating when other people don't see it. They're like, oh, what are you talking about? He, that per, that Jill, she just had an off day. Like that's, you know, you're making too much out of this. Or, oh, that's just Bob. He's just like that. People are just justifying stuff right and left. And this goes back to like us learning to get grounded in ourselves. And we're like, okay, you know what? That might be but that doesn't mean that their behavior is not a problem. Like this is still manipulative or this is abusive or, or whatnot. So if we're waiting around to get that validation from other people to see what we see, we're going to be waiting for a really long time and it may not even ever happen. Uh, so um, the more you understand manipulation and problematic behavior, the more your vocabulary surrounding all of this increases. And so then the more words you have to these things, because there's things that you can point to. A lot of this stuff is really confusing when we don't have the terminology for it. And so when we do have the terminology and we're like, you know what, that's triangulating, that's projection, that's denial, that's that's abusive. That's verbally abusive, or that's emotionally abusive, or that's gaslighting. Like these kinds of words, things start to make a lot more sense. And so, yes, there is a lot of this out there. There's a lot of dysfunction in general out there. And, uh, you know, the, but this goes back to like our toolkit of we can either be assertive with it or we can just completely steer clear of it or we can go low contact with that kind of stuff. But when, but I'll tell you, I have this weird kind of game that I play where <laughs> like, I don't know if I necessarily recommend anybody else doing this. It's almost just kind of this, I, I'm doing a, a case study on myself almost. There's certain people I have in my life that I'm very low contact with and I will intentionally spend time with them periodically just to observe their behavior and to observe my like what surfaces within me and it's interesting I like I would not have been able to do that five years ago and I like I said I wouldn't even necessarily recommend it now because it's not um you know like it's it's probably not the healthiest thing to do but there's certain people that I still want to keep contact with because, you know, um, their family and these kind, and they're not awful, awful, but there's definitely a lot of dysfunction there. Uh, but I'll kind of just try to ob stay observant of the whole thing, like of their behavior, of my own behavior, of my understanding of their behavior, of practicing, like being responsive, all of this. So once you see it for what it is, you're much better equipped to come up with some sort of plan with how you're going to respond to it. Uh, let's see.
Let me scroll down here. Amber says, hey, Dana, did you see the commercial that went viral of the siblings who came out against their brother politically? I found it very upsetting that they did all of that, politics aside, just ganging up on him. I saw the commercial and I don't know the full story. I don't know if that, I would imagine, I would imagine that that's more than just politically motivated. I mean, there's got to be, for five, was it five? Five other siblings to come out and just say like, this person's not who I would endorse. I, my guess would be that there's been like a pattern of, of problematic behavior for a very long time. And if I had a sibling who was, who I felt was deeply problematic, like lying, cheating, stealing, pathological, like really dangerous, destructive, should not have power, I would speak out against them. But I don't know if that was, I don't, I don't know what their, their motives were, but my guess is that there's more to the story. But yeah, I think when you do that, then you're realizing like, yeah, I'm really upsetting the apple cart here because I would imagine not only is that probably the end, the, the official end of their relationship with their brother, but there's probably, I, I would imagine their whole family is, you know, going, being very uh, stirred up by that. Okay, so Abuse Free says, thank you, but I get tired of boundary setting with all of these. Uh, any more ideas? Well, and then I think it's, I think it's the whole serenity prayer kind of thing, you know, like realizing like what we have control over, what we don't have control over, and like the knowledge to know the difference or the wisdom to know the difference. And there's certain situations where if we're, if these people are in our life, then we, we said sometimes setting boundaries means like reducing contact. And if it's, and here's how, you know, like when you've set an effective boundary is that you're no longer exhausted and worn out. So if you're continually finding yourself like frustrated and resentful and exhausted and like, Oh, just drained and dreading seeing them and all of this, these are all really fantastic warning signs that, something else still needs to happen. So either more of a boundary needs to be set or more of some sort of like alternate action needs to be taken. And you'll know when you're there, when there's not this level of like disruption in your life, that you have more peace than disruption. So, and sometimes that might mean quitting a job. It might mean moving. It might mean not seeing certain people anymore, or it might mean seeing them very infrequently. It might mean changing the kinds of conversations that you have with them. It might mean, um, you know, any number of things. You'll know based on the level of kind of calm and peace that you have in your life. Rob says, yes, I need to repeat that prayer daily. It's great advice. Yeah, I had a poster board with the serenity prayer written on it that was hung up in my house for a very long time. When, and I'd mentioned this before, but like one of the things that really did help me was, and I think it's just helpful in general. It's part of like, like feeding our brain positive things and steering into that direction that we want to go into because to fight against the pull of all of this darkness and this heaviness it can, it can be quite a challenge. And uh, so I'm a big fan of everything that you've got. Sometimes you just need to give your healing everything that you've got. Doing affirmations, listening to guided meditations, um, paying attention, feeding your brain, nourishing your brain. So really paying attention to how, to what like what your emotional response is to certain things, you know, now might not be the time to watch the news on a regular basis. If it's causing you, you know, a lot of anxiety and upset, then maybe now this is not, maybe not the best time for that. So instead like watching a comedy or 
um, I'll tell you one of my favorite shows right now it, that's kind of my happy, actually not kind of, it totally is my happy place is the, what is it? Britain's next top baker. I think I don't know if it's on Netflix or how we watch it, but um, I love that show. It's just wholesome. <laughs> like it's, there's no manufactured drama. It's just seemingly, you know, good people, having fun creating recipes and it's just a, it's a relaxing show and it's feeding your brain that kind of stuff some documentaries that are enjoyable that are not going to get you all riled up like just being kind to your brain and being aware that if you're really struggling with a lot of anxiety right now it's time to do things a little bit different possibly reducing the amount of caffeine that you're drinking or um you know, just anything that's like overly stimulating in your environment, like these kinds of things. Okay. Oh, and putting up, that's what I was going to say, putting up uh, different words of affirmation around your house. So I went to, I don't remember where, like Walgreens or Michaels or someplace and got a bunch of poster boards and a packet of markers and wrote up a bunch of things. I wrote the serenity prayer. I taped that on, I don't know if it's above my stairs or it was on a wall. I had, um, you know, some other sayings. One was like, I believe that something good will happen to me and through me today, even though I didn't believe that at all. I wanted to believe it. And so that was a real kind of grounding mantra for me at that point in my life. And I was really listening to, even though I don't identify as being Christian, I have a very deep faith in God. And so I was listening to a lot of very uplifting, um, kind of anything uplifting, Tony Robbins. I was listening to Joyce Meyer. I was listening to Joel Osteen. Um, I recently found a uh, wonderful rabbi that I've been listening to on YouTube, um, Jews for Judaism, I believe is his channel. Um I mean, any, anything and everything <laughs> like positive and grounding and good, just feeding your brain. Jana says, if I would have listened to my gut, I would not be in the shape that I am right now. Well, I hear you, sister. I, I think a lot of us would agree with that. And one of the things, one of the big um, lessons that we can squeeze out of this is just the importance of tuning into your instincts. And it's a terrible way to, to learn this lesson. Here's the thing, though. I, I really feel like a, the vast majority of people out there don't listen to their instincts. They really, really don't. And there's a lot of reasons. Like we're kind of culture, no matter what culture a person is, I feel like all cultures really downplay the importance of intuition and in instinct. You know, it, it's, and, and instead we do what we feel is like more socially acceptable. Like we give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't want to be rude. We don't want to, we're waiting for concrete proof. We're, um, like, you know, there's just so many other things that are wrapped around us listening, preventing us from listening to our instincts. And it can really be a challenge to take that, to take those seriously and realize instincts are there for a reason. If you look at any other animals in the animal kingdom, they would have very disastrous consequences as well as if they didn't listen to their instincts. So we have more advanced instincts. The challenge is because we have you know, this logic and critical, that prefrontal cortex, that logic and critical thinking part of our brain, because we can rationalize things, we confuse that with, with being intelligent or like being, um, you know, like what it means to be, yeah, I guess like an intelligent human being and not realizing like we have multiple parts to our brain and they're all valid. They all have messages for us and they all speak to us in different ways. And it's that integration of all parts of our brain 
with understanding our intuition and how our emotions speak to us and the importance of that and all of that is just such a game changer. Bob or Rob was saying, you know, rational versus instinct and intelligent. Yeah, you know, and the, um, here's the thing. We all think that we're rational. <laughs> and the vast majority of the time, we're not. People are not. We're after taking action out of our defense mechanisms, like a lot of the time. And we're, we're not rational people. We're rationalizing. And so when you start really seeing reality clearly, your own reality, the reality of other people, how all of this intertwines, and we're able to kind of understand our own defense mechanisms and other people's defense mechanisms and just all of this other stuff, that's when we start seeing stuff clearly. And we, we actually start being a rational person. So uh, it's... And, you know, and logic and critical thinking, like that stuff's not taught in school and it really, it really should be. So, okay. Um, Khan says, yes, I ignored my instincts too. But, you know, like I said, I think most people do. And it takes a situation like this. And not even this situation. I think it takes us understanding the importance of our instincts. Like, I didn't, even though I knew, I, I think, I, and I've mentioned this before. So when I was going through my healing process from my first narcissistic relationship, I had a friend of mine had given me this flip book of like different quote, like motivational quotes and stuff. And, um, and one of them was follow your bliss. It's a Joseph Campbell quote. And I sat there and I stared at that quote for so long because it, that was like that entry point, like that mind sweeper moment, you know, where you kind of, you're clicking on mind sweeper game and then boom, like this whole chunk just opens up for you. And I was like, I followed my bliss and I, this is what happened. So what do I do with this? Like, how do I make sense of this concept of follow your bliss? And it took me a long time of like really, really thinking about that. And it was the realization of it's great to follow your bliss, but never at the expense of, of sacrificing your peace. And that's the disc, that's the piece of the puzzle that I was missing with that is when oftentimes when we're following our bliss, it, it can be that it's more of us following the fantasy or us um, having some sort of like unresolved wound that's being triggered. It's, it's this feeling, it, when, when we're taking action from a place of like euphoria, of like, oh my goodness, like this is totally it. And, you know, um, especially if it's somebody that we don't know, like we meet a total, we meet a new person and we're so caught up in this whirlwind and we think that they're so amazing and that they're the love of our life and our soulmate and this, that, and the other. And we're so super excited about it. And we get caught up or we might even be like contributing to creating that whirlwind. This is a time to slow down and it can be very difficult to slow down because it feels so right. But it tends to feel so right because it's this master manipulation. And then when that whirlwind, you know, which eventually tends to turn into a tornado and then our, there's massive destruction and we're left scratching our head wondering what we did wrong. But it's that whole, like, you've got to follow your peace first and foremost, because if we follow our bliss, like that can lead us, that's a siren song that'll kind of cause our ship to crash upon rocks. And it can be really difficult to, to walk away because it sounds so good. It sounds so, so good. And here's the other thing too, what people tend to find, we'll talk more about this tomorrow night too. Book club, by the way, again, 6.30 PM Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. We're going to be discussing the book, uh, Facing Love Addiction by Pia Melody. But 
one thing I wanted to talk about too, and people back to the question of, well, how do I know for sure that they're a narcissist or a sociopath? When it's very common for a person to come across a new person that's really charming, male or female, they're telling them everything that they want to hear. There's that amazing connection. The, um, the intimacy, right? That's not even intimacy. Like the sex basically is off the charts. Like there's this tremendous amounts of chemistry. And this goes back to the follow your peace kind of a thing. If, if something's real, it doesn't feel, remember what we were talking about earlier, you know the truth in large part by the way that it feels. It doesn't feel true. When you know the truth, it's like this deep sense of like knowing. It just resonates like a deep chord within you. And you're like, yes. There's a sense of calm and clarity about that. When something, when there's that, when you're feeling like a sheet in the wind, like your insides are fluttering, right? And uh, you're feeling uncertain and anxious and um, you're going back and forth and you're like, I don't know, is, is this too good to be true? But maybe it's not, but what if it is, but I'm scared it is. And all of that, that waffling, that tends to be that cognitive dissonance. Cause that's what that is. That means that there's something that there's a deeper part of you that's picking up on generally insincerity is what it's picking up on. And if you can, if you can tighten up your, your standards to be like, you know what, I don't do, I don't need to be around people that make that cop such a visceral reaction in me that I'm feeling like a sheet in the wind. And I'm feeling like I want to go throw up because I can't tell if they're going to hurt me. I can't tell if they're a safe or unsafe person. I can't tell if it's me or if it's them. If you're feeling, if you're, when you're around a new person, you feel like a magnet has been taken to your compass and you're detecting insincerity. Like this person is telling me that they love me pretty much right out of the gate. They seem to be very interested in making me their whole world. They're telling, they're saying these, I'll never hurt you. I would never cheat on you. I'll be so good to you. They're using all of this kind of like poetic and flowery language. They're telling me everything I want to hear. That stuff, it's always, it's always insincere. That's part of like the infatuation process and um, healthy people don't do that kind of stuff because it's not, it's, they don't need to, you know, like that, the Rome, there's still romance there, but it's not love bombing. It's not so intense and over the top. And Pia Melody talks about this in her book, uh, which we'll be discussing tomorrow, but about, you know, um, it can be so hard to walk away from that because it's the, it's oftentimes it's the fantasy of this like amazing prince or princess charming kind of person. And it can be really difficult to realize, like, especially if you've come across like a more of like a somatic narcissist where they're very sexual, there's an intense physical chemistry. And, um, a lot of people fear they're like, I'm, I'm so scared that I'm never going to love like that again. But I think you have to realize that so much of that was manufactured. Like this person was putting on a performance and like normal people don't do that. And so that's not love. Like that's manipulation and real love. It's there's that level. There's intimacy, like true intimacy there. And that level of connection, it's, it's just so different and it's based, there's a solid foundation there. Um, so it's just a very different way of like learning to, to see the world. Okay, let's see. Yeah, Grace was saying, I grew up watching TV and the waffling always meant love. Okay, that's a great point. This is another kind of a big aha moment, right? So, so many people, this is what we're fed with movies and music and media of this toxic relationships or what love is. So many people have 
trauma bonds confused for love. And I get it because they can cause, they cause these really intense emotions and it can leave a person feeling like I've, I've never had this pull to another person like this. And it's this feeling of like, they caused me so much pain, but only they can take the pain away kind of a thing. And it's, especially if they're really manipulative and they're put, putting on this performance in bed and it's like, oh my goodness, like this, we connect on so many levels, except, except when they're being abusive or they're freezing me out or doing silent treatment, or I'm acting in a way that they don't approve of, or they just, just up and vanish. Um, and they, they're, I'm caught up in their game. Like it breaks my heart because it's not love. And if we're using this, this, um, like you, we're using the wrong yardstick to measure what love is, because that's not it. You know, love is, it's an action verb. It's, it's appreciation. It's how we're treat. It's how we treat other people and how they treat us. You know, it's not that these, this level of like crazed intensity and obsession and compulsion and, and uh, persistence and stock. It's not what you see in twilight. It's not what you see in 50 shades of gray. Like that's abuse. That's stalking. That's psychotic. And PM Melody talks about this in her book. And I'm so glad she did. She's like, these relationships are, these are the ones that end up like homicidal because it's such a a puppeteering another person's emotions. And the people that often get puppeteered, us, the love addicts, if we're in these relationships, because we're stemming from a place of a kind of fear of abandonment, like we're wanting to keep these relationships together because maybe we've suffered a lot of loss in our life and we just don't, we're tired. We don't want to go through any more loss. Like we just want to have stability. We want a relation, like a long lasting relationship. We want somebody, we want the fantasy. We want somebody to grow old with. We want some solid friends that we've known for a long time. Or if we grew up feeling unloved or unimportant for any length of time. And now as an adult, we're dating people, um, that, you know, if we're being drawn to people that admit that the love bombing, right. And that level of intensity where they make us feel so loved and so important, we're just drinking that up. And then we're, we're getting drunk off of it and we're not seeing the situation clearly. So it tends to be people that are starved out emotionally tend to be really drawn to that level of intensity, but that, that intensity is never healthy. It's always a red flag. Either the person, they may or may not be a narcissist or a sociopath, but at a minimum, they're, they've got some major emotional issues to work through. A good example of this, um, and I don't mean this in any type of like uh, mean way, but I think a, a, a good kind of current example, it's always easier to see this stuff in other people, okay, is if you look up um, Trish Paytas on YouTube, there's videos between the, her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, Jason Nash, recently posted a video called like, it's on his channel. If you go to Jason Nash, his channel, it's something like why Trish hasn't been in my videos lately. And it's, I don't even know, 20 minutes of highly manipulative behavior on her end. And I thought that's a great example of the push-pull, the manipulation the intensity, the, you know, um, planting seeds of doubt and insecurity. And my guess is with Trish, it's coming from that place of the fear of abandonment. Like she wants to have, she wants him to stay. She wants to have this relationship. But if you kind of know her whole history, it's kind of these short-lived high intensity relationships. And it's heartbreaking to watch another person go through that. But until in, in PM Melody talks about this in her book, like if you have a love addict like that, a dysfunctional person is always going to bring dysfunction to whatever relationship they're in. So I don't know Jason Nash. I, I don't know Trish Paytas either, but like his, um, he doesn't have to even be a love avoidant person. Like he could just be a normal, regular guy. But when you get tangled up with somebody who's got all of these unaddressed issues with kind of these potential fears of abandonment and they don't know how 
to get their needs met. And so they're doing all of these kind of manipulative things. It's, it pushes people away. So uh, I don't know. If you watch that video, I'll be curious to see kind of what you guys think about it. Dave says, how do I find a therapist in my area who really understands narcissistic personality disorder? I've looked and paid for someone who has little knowledge. I think it's more uh, what might help is finding somebody who's familiar with like emotional and psychological abuse and kind of depending on like where you are in the healing process. So if you're fresh out, it, it um, finding somebody like that is from that, that can help kind of guide you through uh, just understanding kind of different forms of abuse and kind of um, you know what to expect. So when you're calling different therapists, saying you know I just recently got out of I would use the terminology like emotional or psychologically abusive relationship, and. I wouldn't use the word like narcissist or borderline or any of that kind of stuff. I would focus on like what you, ex what your, where you are with everything. So, um, and kind of hone in on that or finding somebody that's familiar with, um, PTSD from different forms of abuse. It's a challenge and it's like finding a good professional in any field. And sometimes it takes, going through a few to find one that you really connect with. But I will tell you, it's just been my experience as a whole that uh, abuse, it's really difficult to find a good therapist who's familiar, who's truly familiar with all of the different aspects of abuse. So, you know, if you're, another thought might be to consider uh, a life coach. There's a few out there that are on YouTube that talk about on this topic that are, are deeply familiar with this. So there, um, you know, that might be another avenue, but at least you kind of, I think the benefit of doing, going through somebody that you find on YouTube, like a life coach or, or whatnot, is at least, you know, what they know, you kind of know what you're getting. Um, that's a thing. Uh, support groups. I have a support group. Uh, there's one on my website, thriveafterabuse.com. There's one on Facebook, um, you know, that that can help too. So just, just some thoughts. Amal is talking about Trish Paytas and says she comes across as having borderline personality disorder. I would agree. And I would say it's a pretty extreme, um, if she does, which I think she has come out before and says that she does, that's, I would, it's a kind of a more of a classic case of what a lot of like borderline behavior looks like, but it's also extreme. So and again, I'm not saying that to like pathologize her or to, um, you know, shame her in any way. It's, it's, a, yeah, you know, it's a challenge. And I, I think it, it's sad. It's sad when you see a per. Of course, like we all have insight into other people, right? Like it's so much easier to see other people's challenges in life than our own. And, um, it's sad to see her continually go through these patterns and with food addiction and with um, men and with, I think a lot of like body issues and low self-esteem and you're like, Oh girl, like it doesn't have to be this way, but it's a challenge. Lisa asks, Dana, what do you think about YWCA counseling? It's one of those things, I think you just, if you can talk to somebody over the phone for a few minutes and see if there's a connection, if you can, uh, it's, it's just really hit or miss. And so it's, um, 
if you're at, if, if you do talk to them, say, this is what I'm here for. This is what I'm looking for support with like healthy boundaries and, um, you know, emotional and psychological abuse. And, and is this something that you feel like that you could help me with and then see what they say. So. Mommy says, I wonder how it's possible to be a so-called therapist when they can't recognize narcissism. Well, I would say, and it's frustrating for me when a person, there's so many things that are not taught and uh, healthy boundaries, like um, kind of the foundations of being healthy are really not taught. And uh, the depth of narcissism is not, I, I just don't even think like, a person has to go through it. And I think they have to almost go through it in, a, in like several different ways to really even begin to get a, a fuller picture of the level of like domination and deceit. It's just hard for a normal and decent person to even begin to wrap their mind around it. But yeah, there's definitely a need there within the mental health community. So, and it is frustrating. I, I don't, for, I think most people here know, like I'm finishing up my master's in counseling. I have no desire to um, necessarily do like one-on-one -on -one counseling, but my goal is to do more of like psychoeducation, uh, like the focus on healthy boundaries, just education, the educational piece of the puzzle with like boundaries and understanding manipulation and abuse and all of this and, and um, you know, on a more like on a bigger level. So uh, it's frustrating for me because as I go through all my coursework, you know, I'm like, okay, so like, when do we get to the part where we really talk about manipulation or uh, any of this? And it's, you know, there's one, I get to take one elective class, elective on abnormal psychology. That's a crime that should be standard. Because if you don't understand abnormal psychology, like how much are you missing? You know, it's ridiculous. And then, you know, we have uh, even classes on like assessment and, uh, you know, kind of understanding different personality disorders. It's just, it's not covered in the depth that it needs to be. And it's, it's, uh, it's frustrating. Thanks, Jennifer. She says you'd be really great for that sort of work. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I was just going to say, Ileana says, I wish you were an instructor in high school health class. That's kind of what I want to do. Like, I'd like to be able to go give talks to like high schools and to really in um, to all age groups. Obviously, it would be age appropriate, but to create more of a like a seminar or a class or some sort of curriculum around understanding this material because people once people get, it doesn't take very long for people to get this. Like this is, this does not have to be this complicated, you know, and it shouldn't be mysterious. Like the, people, we shouldn't have to wait until people are come crawling in, you know, battered and bruised emotionally or physically to then have these conversations like there's no need for this like let's be more proactive and have these conversations earlier on yeah jennifer says yeah this sort of thing should definitely be taught at a younger age up yours narc says yeah you and angie should do a tour yeah that would be fun get like an rv <laughs> just go tooling around the united states Yeah, Rebecca says, yes, my neighbor knows. She's the same major as him and says everything makes sense when I explain to her about how he's a narcissist. Yeah, I mean, and and it's and it, I think it's just, and it's not even necessarily like just even the narcissist. I mean, I think that's definitely like the, the entry point for most people. Like most people, when they're in extreme pain, they start trying to figure out why am I in extreme pain? Right. And so it's that understanding about, about narcissism 
that opens um, that door. Oh, I forgot to set my timer. Oh, shoot. I think, hold on a sec. I'm sorry, I just realized that. I, I don't know, how late do we go? We go to 1130, right? So if I go an hour and 15, and then we'll start winding down, is that right? No, that's not right. <laughs> hold on, hold on just a second. I gotta do, do in math in public, it's not, not good. Okay, I think we go for another hour and then we'll wind down. Um, but yeah, the understand, I mean, all of it, like the, the understanding our emotions and like kind of these empty buckets that we can ha sometimes have and how this can lead to other things. And, and even just a correct working map of the terrain, you know, if, if people are going through life and they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, I've been all these the movies sell us on this concept of, you know, this happily ever after. And that these two like deeply broken people can somehow get together and heal each other. And, you know, it, it, and it all works out. Like it doesn't work that way. And, or that you complete me, right. Like, or the twilight stuff or the 50 shades of gray stuff. And, um, just so much dysfunction running around out there. It's like, well, no wonder. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Colin says I, Dana, I would attend any conference or talk you had. Well, thank you. That is cool. I would love to start doing uh, seminars and going around and, and doing talks and stuff. I, there's so many things I need to figure out how to even do that. I've had people approach me that want to do, that want to put together seminars. My hesitation with that is it can be such a massive undertaking. And my concern would be, if you're familiar at all with YouTube, <laughs> like doing, uh, having an event that would wind up like TanaCon, where they got way in over their heads, they've tried to put together the seminar. And it was not that I think a ton of people would necessarily show up, but it turned into like this total debacle. And I, I have no experience in planning seminars. And so I would just be concerned that we wouldn't know what we were doing, and that we, it would just be a total train wreck. And I don't want that to happen. So um, that's why I haven't done anything so far. Healing, hopeful survivor. Oh, sorry, cat. Ugh. There's all this cat hair in here. Ugh. Healing Hopeful says, I watched a documentary on cult leaders last night, Dana. Do these narcissist sociopaths actually believe what they are saying? I mean, to get 900 people to drink Kool-Aid blows my mind. It's evil. I think to some extent they do believe that. So if you're dealing with somebody that's delusional and they could also be mentally ill too. And they could be mentally ill and personality disordered. Like it doesn't have to be an, an or thing. Like it can be both. So when you're dealing with somebody that's, that's delusional, uh, this is, the, oh man, there's so much that I want to do surrounding all of this. Uh, this is my concern with like a lot of, I see this a lot with like the new age movement is there's a lot of people out there that have some like really outrageous claims that they are an alien, that they are a reincarnation of somebody that they have all kinds of supernatural powers that they, um, you know, uh, it's, it's grandiosity, but it's to the point where it's, it's a delusion. And, but if you get people that are like, well, but they need that concrete proof. Well, how do you know? How do you know? Which I get, I get the need for concrete proof. But the thing is, if they can't prove it, like just because a person says that they're the reincarnation of Jesus, or that they say that they're the reincarnation of Cleopatra, or that they can talk to extraterrestrials, or all of this doesn't make it true. Like, that's not proof of anything. It's, I mean, how do you know a person is schizophrenic or they're actually Jesus? Like, this, they, there needs to be more proof than a person just saying that they're Jesus, right? So having like that healthy degree of skepticism is really, really important because that's how people get so far off the trail is they, they are wanting to 
feed, they want to eat up the fantasy that's being sold to them. And if you've got a person who's delusional and they might really believe that in whatever it is that they're doing, uh, you know, Charles Manson was a paranoid schizophrenic and obviously unmedicated and personality disordered. So antisocial personality on top of that. And you get with somebody like that, he can hold it together relatively well, considering that he's really profoundly, is very ill. He was a very ill person. He, he was convincing enough and charismatic enough that he was able to get a group around him. And when he was younger, he was good looking. And that kind of stuff can be the perfect storm. I fully believe that he believed everything that he was. I've worked with enough schizophrenic people to know like that's how that illness works. So, but just because, you know what I'm saying? So like that healthy degree of skepticism and pe people just need to understand that there's other people out there that they can present really, really well. But if they're saying stuff that seems really far out there, it's healthy to require some sort of proof and um just faith in them doesn't cut it yeah new life says the bible warns against false prophets yes yes and it's important to really i mean there's all different you've got people out there um you know, there's always those, those healing pastor people that'll claim or psychics that claim to know stuff, but really they have like an earbud in and they're getting fed information about somebody. Like there's different degrees of like intent and maliciousness and awareness, self-awareness when it comes to these kinds of people. But at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't matter if they're schizophrenic. It doesn't matter if they're um, personality disorder. It doesn't matter if they really believe it, if their behavior is going to lead a person to drink poisoned Kool-Aid, then it's, it's a problem. Yeah. And then Nikki says, yes. And then you throw drugs on top of it all. Right. And then you really get some outrageousness. Yours, Narc says they are the devil incarnate. It's just pure and simple, something majorly off the charts evil with how they operate. Well, you know, and Amal says, I believe a lot of religions and cults were created by delusional narcissists. I, I agree completely. I agree completely. I think when anybody's, I think here's a good determining factor when somebody is more focused on it's the, the thing of follow me versus follow like, or not even follow. Like, I think that's a warning sign right there. Um, but if they're more focused on follow me, I have all the answers versus look at my message and what I'm saying or hold on to what helps, let the rest go. Or I, or the understanding of I'm, if, if there's anything that you're getting out of this, like, I'm a speaker on this topic. Like, don't follow me, learn to follow you. That's the difference. So if somebody's like, yes, I am a prophet. I am a guru. I have all the answers. Follow me. I think that's, you're about like, you're on that same <laughs> like meridian of narcissism. Like it, there's a very solid chance that you're dealing with somebody with a really unhealthy ego. So, um, it's just important. Like there's just no shortcut around us turning inward, getting centered in ourselves, deciding for ourselves, like knowing your what's right and wrong for you, and then finding your own North Star and then following in that. Even if you're in a room full of people that are like, I totally disagree with you, you're making a big deal out of things, or this person is the second coming of Christ, that you're able to just say, you know what, this feels off to me. And Maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. I don't know. I don't need to know for certain. Like, I just know that this is not, this is, doesn't sit well with me and I need to do something different.
uh, Maya says they did say Bill Cosby was diagnosed with, <clears throat> was diagnosed with a personality disorder and is court ordered to have therapy for the rest of his life. Well, didn't he get three years? I saw something fleeting that he was uh, had gotten three years in jail. Or three to 10, I think, maybe. But yeah, I would say his behaviors, hands down, personality disordered. I mean, that's pretty psychopathic. I, I mean, antisocial all day long. Superficially charming, driven by dominance and deceit, was able to compartmentalize his behavior, had a really great relationship with his wife, but then, you know, was out drugging and raping women. Um, you know, cheating on his wife nonstop by raping people. Like, I mean, all of the, like, it's all a huge, huge, huge problem. The two very different sides of himself, uh, kind of no, obviously no empathy or regard for, for his targets. Um, and what's even more disturbing to me, I, I went to go watch a video the other, yesterday, because we were just talking about this on Angie's live stream, uh, about his jail his sentencing. And so I went to go click on a video for um, the news to watch it. And I made the mistake of scrolling down to the comments. And it was a bunch of comments that were completely supportive of him. And I was just horrified by what I was reading and people minimizing it and saying, you know, that it was racially motivated and that, uh, you know, he was framed and that these women were just the gold diggers and, um, you know, he's old and he should just be left alone and on and on and on. I'm like, man, it's really wild how people can do some mental gymnastics to continue to justify this stuff. Like he admitted to drugging women and having sex with them when they couldn't give, they were so drugged out, that they couldn't give consent. Like that's a rape. Like he admitted to this. So I don't see where there's any like question as, as far as his guilt goes. Okay, Mothering Hand says, my daughter and her two children are in a domestic violence relationship. Both of the children, oh my goodness, are talking about killing themselves. I've told them to talk to their mom. How do I help my grandchildren? They're 18 and 10. That's a, oh my goodness. Um, how just heartbreaking and stressful all at the same time. Um I would say at a minimum, if they're here in the United States, there's suicide hotlines. They can, if they have a phone, if they have access to the phone, the 18 year old probably does. I don't know if the 10 year old does. There's the suicide text line is 741-741. And then there's, I'd have to, let's look it up real quick. There's a suicide hotline um, here in the U.S. It's 24 hours a day. It's one 800 Two seven three eight two five five. So I would say that would be a good resource to give them immediately. And then uh, I, you might need to do more to intervene if they've been talking about killing them. This is the, this is the hard part with stuff like this because these kinds of secrets um, really shouldn't be kept secret. If these kids need help, if they're in an abusive relationship, if she's in an abusive relationship, and it may, if you have a decent relationship with your daughter, it might be a good idea to go out for lunch with her in a kind of a quiet place and express your concerns and just say, these are, this is what the kids are telling me. And honey, like, at, when does it become a problem? You know, uh, I don't know your situation, if it would be an option for the kids to come stay with you or um, if the kids could go stay with somebody else, if, if your daughter is going to stay in that relationship, but it might come to a point where social services need to be involved and the kids need to just be removed if she's not going to leave. And I know that might sound terrible to some people, but you know, it, it, if kids are suicidal, if they're being abused, it's important they, that can't continue. Like there's, there's something that needs to be done. Um, especially the 18 year old can move out, but the 10 year old is, is stuck there. Uh, 
would your daughter also be open to possibly joining our live stream? So that might be, I think that, I think the answer is going to be doing a, a multitude of different things, potentially giving her some resources um, and then getting the, the help, getting the kids the help that they need, getting your daughter the help that she needs and just saying like, uh, you can always, you can call social services anonymously and file a report and just say these kids are being abused. I don't want to give out my name. I this needs to be anonymous, but um, you know, they're reporting that they're feeling suicidal and this is what's going on at home. And I just feel like somebody needs to look into this. Um, you know, if they report that they're feeling suicidal immediately, that they're actually going to act on it, you know, potentially calling 911 and getting them to do a, a safety and welfare check on them. But the, the hard the, the hard thing too is it's going to most likely upset your daughter, you know, because she's in denial. She wants to make this work. She's if she's in love with him, this kind of stuff. She's minimizing all of this. And um, but it doesn't like we. I think there comes a point where it's like we got to protect those who can't protect themselves. And if that if that means her getting really upset with you, if that means her not talking to you, if that means whatever it means then so be it. But these, these kids need some help. Yeah. Up here says I would have given anything to have been removed from my home. Oh. And she's and mothering hand says, yes, uh, I've suggested your website on Facebook and sent things to her several times. She just isn't listening. then if they're, if the children are telling you that they're feeling suicidal, that they don't know what to do, have you asked your daughter? I mean, I don't, that's a lot to take on like two children, but is that something that you, and you don't have to answer on the live stream, but would that be an option to uh, see about the kids coming and living with you? Or uh, potentially taking the kids half the time or something. And, you know, you might also, like I said, just want to call social services anonymously and just say, this is what's going on. And I don't know what to do, but something needs, something needs to be done. Mm. Nikki says, yes, uh, when she was younger, she was told that kids have it way worse than I did. Yeah. And I think that's another one of those like faulty logics that people fall into. And sometimes we even fall into it thinking like, well, my home situation is not good, but other kids have it so much worse. And oftentimes abusers will feed into that. Oh, you should be lucky. Yeah. I yell at you and I cuss you out, but I don't, I don't beat you with a belt like my dad used to. Right. And so then people that are on the receiving end of not that, think, oh, well, I'm just being too soft. I'm being, I'm making a big deal out of nothing. I should be thankful for what I have kind of a thing. And the problem with that thinking is it, it doesn't make a, it's still, it's still a problem, even though it's not the same problem as somebody else has. It, it, like Sam was saying, you know, we're not in a, a pain contest here. Like a problem is a problem and it still needs to be addressed. It's not a competition. It's, if it's a valid problem, it's a valid problem. Uh, let's see here. Leah asks, I'm just confused as to why we have to become silent and complacent to survive. Well, I think a lot of times it's if a person, if leaving isn't an option for whatever reason, a person may be uh, doesn't have the, the resources, they don't have the money, they don't have housing that can be lined up, they don't have the support system, they fear, they, their hope, they're holding on to hope that this person can change, um, 
they their self-esteem has been so eroded that they don't think that they can do it on their own or they've been so traumatized that they're like i barely can function but they don't even know it right they they've been through so much that they don't but they don't identify what they've been through and so they're like i don't and so maybe to try to cope they've turned to drugs or alcohol or any number of things um, that's making them more dependent upon their partner and they're they're just stuck they're stuck for a while. I mean, maybe it's a guy who's being abused and he's like, I'm scared to leave because my um, wife is incredibly abusive and she's probably going to get full custody of the kids. Or even if she gets partial custody, I'm scared to leave the kids alone with her out of retaliation of what she might do. So if a person, if a person feels like they can't leave, then the only other option is to try to cope with staying. And oftentimes a person is going to withdraw and, um, become silent and complacent, complacent because they can't speak up. There's, there is nothing else. If they, if, you know, the only real ways that any of us deal with, um, pain is we fight, 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 flight, freeze are the, the main defenses and if we can't use any of these three, you can't fight with an abuser. It's going to make abuse worse. You know, you can't, if you can't leave, you can't flight. And so what do people do? They freeze. And the only way to break out of that is to, for a person to learn about like assertiveness and, and conflict resolution, but that skill set's not going to help with an abuser. And so they're, then they're only down to fight, flight, or freeze if they're stuck. So it's a challenge. And then to get a person out of that situation, it oftentimes requires coming up with a plan, a whole, a whole life plan of how to be safe, how to leave, how to get some money saved up, how to, how to go about leaving safely. So um, it's a, I mean, I get why people stay. It's a lot to have to try to figure out, especially when you're so traumatized that you're not thinking straight. And oftentimes too, people will stay, you know, you hear from targets of abuse all the time. They're like, well, but I, I loved him or I loved her. And there's that definite, like we were talking about earlier, like that abandonment piece where a person's like, I just want to be loved. Like I, I have these, I'm confusing all of these intense feelings I have with them, all of these highs and lows, all of this intensity and this, what I feel to be chemistry. I feel like this person's my soulmate. I feel like this intense connection to them. I just want them to change. I just, and I'll do whatever it takes to keep this relationship going. So I just don't want this relationship to end. But what people tend to do when they try to keep the relationship going is then they start grinding down parts of themselves in order to keep their partner happy. And so there is that like silent and complacent and obedient part of it all. And, it, and you now that we're talking about it, like you can see like this is the perfect storm um, for a person to just, like, I mean, their whole sense of self just becomes eroded in something like that. It's just, uh, it's heartbreaking. Yes, Khan says, yes, hope with a narcissist is our downfall. And that's, yeah, I, I think most normal, if this is the toolkit we're given, right? If we kind of grow up in a society or with a family where the, the messages are, you know, family is for, forever, commitment is forever, uh, divorce is bad, um, uh, friendship is forever, you've got to forgive and forget, um, you know, hurt people, hurt people. So if somebody hurts you, you just need to be more compassionate. Um, having boundaries aren't healthy in relationships. Like you should share everything with your other partner and they should share everything with you. And, um, you know, uh, you basically to be a good wife means to be obedient. Like these, kind, I mean, you think like all of these kinds of messages or to even be, I think you see the same thing with men. Like to be a good husband also means to be obedient, right? If mama's happy, ain't nobody happy kind of a thing. And so then that's the, the reverse, the reverse to that message. And so it's, 
all of these really, if these messages are taken out of context, like within the context of like healthy boundaries and standards and communication and uh, this kind of stuff, a lot of these messages aren't necessarily a bad thing. Family being forever, commitment being forever, you know, but if you're family or committed to a really pathological toxic person, that's when things become a problem. So if our toolkit is all about holding on to hope, thinking that our love or understanding or therapy or religion or rehab is gonna fix them, we, then we're gonna be waiting for a very long time and we're gonna be dragged through hell the whole time. So. Uh, Rebecca says, is the life or death situation perceived, wait, is the life or death situation perceived threat or actual real danger? I think it depends on the threat, but we tend to have the same type of response. So if to real or perceived danger, and this is where PTSD kind of stuff can get really confusing. For, so here's an example for me. Um, I don't do well with like loud noises or like sudden movement. It just about brings me to my knees. And that's one of like the most debilitating, I don't know about debilitating, uh, strongest reactions I have still, okay? And even though I know <laughs> that it's the UPS man at the door, when he pound, even though I'm expecting him and if he pounds on the door, it, I go into fight or flight. So even though I know that that threat's not real, that he's a very nice man, I had many an interaction with him uh, and I, I'm expecting him, my body still is just overstimulated by that. And it's just part of that, that hypervigilance. And that's still there for me. It's, it, it just kind of is, it is what it is. So um If a person's actively in an abusive situation and they're, the, here's the thing too, it's like this awareness, like when we start waking up to understanding what a problem is, like we might've been, odds are we have been really like minimizing being like threatening situations. It's intimidating when somebody becomes aggressive. If they start yelling at us, if they start standing too close, if they start cussing at us, if they start pressuring us, if they start doing these kinds of things, these are all different signs of aggression. If our understanding of aggression has only been somebody becoming physically violent or a really scary person that looks like a scary person, like when we start expanding our understanding of like what, aggress what aggressive behavior looks like, then a lot of how we're feeling around certain people starts to make sense. Like we don't, we don't, we're like, oh, I'm not crazy after all. I'm not overreacting. Like this person's getting louder and louder. They're getting more animated. They're get, they're starting to get closer and closer to me. Like if we're not aware of, uh, you know, kind of our boundaries and our physical boundaries with other people and that it's okay, it's okay to, to be put off by that kind of behavior, um, then we're going to be misinterpreting. If we're not aware of this, then we're misinterpreting our fight or flight signals. And we're going to think that we're making too big of a deal out of things, but in actuality, we're not. Uh, Leah says, I can't handle verbal criticism. It crushes me and I crumble the way someone who wasn't, oh, the way someone who wasn't built properly would. So here, okay. So here's the thing too, with, with criticism is most people have a difficult time taking criticism. It's, it can be absolutely crushing, uh, especially if the, the person that's giving criticism isn't giving constructive criticism and they're not being tactful about it. Like brutal honesty is abusive and it's not okay. Like nobody likes somebody just being like, oh, I'm just gonna tell you how it is. Like there, that kind of stuff, it's not helpful. Like it's, it's shaming another person is what it is. And that kind of stuff flies under the radar of like, I just need to be honest. I think that's the right thing to do. And it's like, no, <laughs> like, dude, nobody responds well to that kind of stuff. 
Uh, but Pia Melody has talked about that. I think her, the way that she defines boundaries is just, I think, very helpful. Uh, she, how does she describe? She has different words for boundaries. Like she has them divided up. There's like a physical boundary, a containment boundary. Maybe it's the contain, I think it might be containment boundary. But if you think of, if you think of a boundary, like a functional containment boundary of that we can't, like it controls what we take in and what we let out. So what we're letting out, what we're expressing is is not abusive. Like we're able to filter it. Like we might, most of us have really strong opinions about things, right? And so, but we know better to be like, okay, brutal honesty isn't helpful. It oftentimes make, makes a person just collapse. Like it's the only reason a person would be brutally honest with another person is to make themselves feel better. Like to knock another person down and, and make them subconsciously make themselves feel better. Like there's just no, um, unless a person's asking for brutal honesty, but even still like, tact is always uh it's a mature response with getting our point across but like other because other people can be so hateful it's important that we learn to have a kind of that healthy containment boundary to where we're not internalizing stuff so if somebody does come at us and they're saying a bunch of really ugly things uh to where we're not internalizing it to where we can be like you know what some of, and some of what they're saying might even be true, but it's like the way that they're saying it with all of that, that hate and anger and awfulness, like this is a reflection of them. This is not a reflection of me. So it, it can help to think about like, we don't have to internalize everything that another person comes at us with, but this is oftentimes something that takes practice. Like for example, when I first started my YouTube channel, I knew, I mean, like it's the internet, right? I expected some degree of like trolling and hate and, and whatever, <laughs> knowing it and then actually living it are two very different things. And I, and here's not even that extreme of an example. I was thinking about this the other day of like, oh my gosh, how far I've come. The old me, if somebody unsubscribed from my channel or disliked a video, I really took that hard and it hurt my feelings. Like I, and I stewed about that. I'm like, oh no, what did I do that was wrong? And I'm trying so hard to like get my, get this message out and I just want to help people. And I just really internalized that. And then when the comp that I had some hate comments coming up, I had some like, um, even like constructive criticism, but back then that kind of stuff, and I wouldn't say even constructive, like brutal, <laughs> Con, like, quote unquote constructive criticism that kind of stuff would just level me or if people would call me names or stuff like that it just it felt like somebody's kicking the chair out from underneath me I just wasn't emotionally prepared for it and so then now I've been able to move forward and it's like okay it's just I, it doesn't even phase me anymore like it's just part of it and I you know if it's constructive criticism, I squeeze out as much as I possibly can. And then I let, I let the rest go. Uh, but yeah, we don't need to internalize as I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, okay, sorry, scrolling up. There's a lot going on in the chat. Yeah, Jill says, I had to grow to receive good criticism and to ignore bad criticism. 
it took me about five years while healing from abuse. Yeah, it's, there's just so, there's so much in all of this um, that we can use towards our personal growth. Things <laughs> that we never even thought that we needed to learn or that we didn't even think were related to this tend to surface. And as we move through all of this, uh, you know, it's, so lots, lots of self-awareness and personal growth come from this. Mike was saying that, yeah, no doctors will ever understand narcissism unless they are trained in personality disorders. And I will tell you that even if they are, it's one thing to know about it. Uh, it's a totally other thing to be involved in a like like a dynamic with one as a co to be on the receiving end of all of their pathology like you it's just hard for a person who's not in it to even begin to understand it um even if they do understand personality disorders i mean i used, I used to work as a psychiatric nurse and this was an ongoing thing there we worked all 100% of the clients that we saw were either mentally ill, like profoundly mentally ill or personality disordered or both. And we had the benefit of case files on everybody. A lot of our, our people that we saw were court appointed. And we had people that were child molesters, that were, were rapists, that were murderers, that had committed like really awful crimes. And so we had the benefit of like, okay, this is what they've been diagnosed with. Like, this is their case history. This is their behavior history, which the vast majority of people, mental health professionals, unless you're working in a field like that or in a facility like that, you don't have that. All you have is a person walking through your door who's self-reporting. They're telling you their life history from their perspective. Well, <laughs> you know, guess what? Like if you've got a person who's mentally ill or their personality disorder or both, they're not an accurate historian. They're gonna they're gonna most likely, especially if they're personality disordered, present themselves as the victim of every single situation. They minimize you're because all you when you're dealing, especially with like narcissism or antisocial you're dealing, you're not even really dealing with the person, you're just dealing with all of their defense mechanisms. So a, a, per, a mental health professional, it's gonna be very difficult for them. It's gonna take some time, generally, if they're even remotely convincing, for, for them to sort out what's really going on here. So, um, but like I said, we even had like, the benefits of like full case histories and case managers and, you know, the, the courts and, and everybody else. And still you see like antisocial personality disorder and it's sort of like, they don't come across as, you know, the bad guy in the trench coat twirling their mustache. Many of them are very charming, likable. Uh, you would never guess in a million years that they were capable of such things. And I can't tell you how many therapists that we had that were oftentimes were and not, I was going to say young, but not even a lot of, some of them were just brand new to like this field and really had this idea of like, I'm going to save the world and I'm going to be the one to get through to them. And they really seem to be working through therapy and, you know, and it's sort of like, you've been around the block a few times and you're like, yeah, I know exactly like who your client is and honey, they're blowing sunshine at you because they're trying to get off probation. Like you're not even understanding like the level of manipulation and yeah, they do come across and they create this connection with other people that makes you feel like you're special, unique, and different. You've gotten through to them when nobody else has, and th they're manipulative. Like this is part of manipulation. And we had one lead therapist who thankfully was con understood this and like continually would just be like, remember they're manipulative. Remember they're going to say everything that they they think that you want them to say, like, remember, this is what we've been dealing with. You know, this is their, their history for the past, their criminal record for the past 26 years. Like, let's not think that the next, you know, 18 months of therapy 
like, let's be realistic here and um, realize that like these people are driven by dominance and deceit. They're going to say, they're going to play a game. It's generally a game to them. And uh, so let's not get too excited by what we consider to be like results because they will cry. They will claim to have a big breakthrough. They will do all kinds of things. And it's just another level to their game. So even knowing about it and working in it, it's still like, you know, ridiculous. Like if anybody were to meet my exes, they would, I don't, I don't know. I don't think most people would see their behavior for what it is right away. Yeah, I agree. Kathy says no one who ever, who never experienced narcissistic abuse does not truly understand. Like, I just, I agree. I don't think I can try, we can all try to, to paint a picture of it, but it sounds like, it sounds dramatic. It sounds like we're exaggerating. It sounds that we're like making ourselves into being martyrs and them into being devils. Like we're angels, they're devils. Like it's, I get, I totally get how it sounds, but like I also know what I went through. So, you know, I, and it's frustrating. It's just, it's just frustrating across the board. <sighs> yeah. And that's a good point too. Mike says, yeah, same as depersonalization or PTSD or paranoia. It just doesn't make sense to anyone else. Yeah. And Rebecca says, yes. How could I explain myself that I feel like I'm going to be killed? No one understands that. And, you know, I think this is the thing like we have, we just have to get to the place of like knowing who is emotionally safe and releasing the need for validation from others because they're so, they're missing the context. They're not on the receiving end of it. So, like, what, especially if your life is being threatened, you know, like you just need to do what you need to do in order to stay safe. And other people, police might not understand, friends and family might not understand. Um, and that's a really terrifying place to be where you just don't, like other people don't take it seriously. They're like, oh, he, you're being drama. Like he's not really gonna do anything. He's all talk, blah, blah. Well, guess what? You know, like nobody thinks that. Like the, the, you see all these Dateline stories and I, I guarantee the family was going through the exact same thing. And the target was going through the exact same thing. So like, you just have to, we have to err on the side of caution, you know? It's frustrating. And same thing with PTSD, like what Mike was saying, um, it doesn't make sense to anybody else. Like it hardly even makes sense to us, right? And we're living it. And so it's frustrating when other people don't get it or my, my biggest frustration is when people are told because like it's this, this this stage in awareness where people are like, I'm like we were talking about earlier, oh, I'm seeing manipulation or abuse like everywhere. I, I'm seeing I'm seeing it on TV, I'm seeing it in movies, I'm listening to I'm listening to lyrics and songs, I'm seeing it with some certain coworkers and certain people in my life and problematic behavior in my neighbor and uh, this, that, and the other, and then they go into therapy and it's totally just minimized and disregarded as, oh, well, you're just hyper, you're just, uh, you know, dysregulated due to the abuse. And it's so much more than that. Like it's, it's, that's, like I said, it's a part of it, but it's, you're seeing problematic behavior clearly. So like, don't lose that. Like, don't let somebody talk you out of that because it's, it's when we've been going through life, glossing over problematic behavior, giving people the benefit of the doubt, having that, that toolkit of how we interacted with other people, how we understood their behavior on our own, all of this stuff. And you realize, oh my gosh, like this toolkit that I had wasn't complete. And there's major things that I'm missing here, but other people just, um, yeah, they don't understand. It's, and it's frustrating. Some people do, but I said the vast majority don't. Uh, 
Valerie says, I just got a letter from my ex. He lives, he lives 300 feet away. What should I do? Return it? Gosh, did you open it? Uh, I, do you guys talk? I mean, I'm assuming you don't talk anymore. James says, my toolkit was found in the clearance aisle. Yeah, I think a lot of us can relate to feeling that way. Yeah, it's like one of those, dis <laughs> totally, that's a really great analogy. It's like one of those discount toolkits that comes with like a flathead screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver, <laughs> a socket wrench, and, and that's it. And like what you really need is a hammer or, you know, a miter saw. Yeah, like this is not, like what I got is not gonna work. Uh, Mike says, I don't know if trauma centers will do EMDR or help with CPTSD. Uh, some, some, I think more and more trauma counselors are getting um, into like EFT, EMDR. So it's a, it's a you know, specific designation, but uh, I think there's a good chance that if you go to a trauma center that they do have people in there that do EMDR and, and EFT. Um, as far as like helping with CPTSD, like right now, PTSD is kind of the, covers like, you know, quote unquote, regular PTSD and a lot of like complex post-traumatic stress disorder as well. So if a person's been traumatized in any way, physically or emotionally, a good trauma counselor should be able to help. Um, but it's worth a phone call to see if they, you know, if they, what, what they do there and what they don't do there. Rebecca says, how do I err on the side of caution in the same college as both of them with one living across from me slamming his door all night? Well, and I missed, I've caught like bits and pieces of what you were saying tonight in the chat. So I might be missing some, some big things here, but sometime it goes back to the whole serenity prayer thing, like figuring out like, well, okay, what do we really have control over and what do we not have control over? And, um, if you've got two really dangerous and destructive, potentially deadly people that you're going to school with, then it might be you need to find different housing. So like living off campus, it might be mean um, seeing about taking some online classes next semester. Uh, it might, it's it, what do you have control over? And so like reverse engineering that. Okay, like you have control over your schedule, you have control over, you know, housing, it's not fair, it's inconvenient, I get all of that. But I, if you can do it, I highly recommend doing it and not just trying to cope with it because coping with really intense things like that just creates so much stress and that's such a ripple effect in your life. And it's really, it's a hard way to live when you're always looking over your shoulder. So... Yeah, that's a good point. Missouri Cowboy says, yeah, it took him 60 years to believe that people would intentionally destroy anyone and certainly not the person that they say that they love. So I no longer expect others to get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really great point. When you see how long and what it took for us to have the breakthrough of like, oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. I'm not dealing with a person that's I'm dealing with a domination driven mindset. I'm not dealing with the solutions oriented mindset. Like I didn't realize there was such a thing. I thought everybody was solutions oriented. Like doesn't everybody just want to be like happy and healthy and be loved and give love. And if they don't, then we just somehow need to be able to fix them. 
and squeeze all of their broken pieces together and then they'll be okay. Right. Like that, that's how most people, that's how like most people think about stuff like this. It's just, it seems almost um, politically incorrect to just be like, you know, some people for whatever reason are just very different. They're profoundly broken and maybe they grew up in a really abusive home. Maybe they were born that way. Maybe they, something happened. Who knows? Who knows? But for whatever reason, they don't attach to other people in a healthy way. And instead, uh, they just they try to destroy other people. Like they're really dangerous, destructive, and deadly. Like they don't have, they're just not, they don't view the world the same way that other, that solutions oriented people do. Yeah, Malta says they can't be fixed because their idea of success is found in their ability to bring others down. Yeah, you know, people had talked, I, I've been meaning to bring this up for a while. Somebody had mentioned um, a while ago about, you know, can religion change a person? And like, well, what if they found God and this, that, and the other? And we talked about this a little bit, but like, it's not, here's here's the challenge and the problem like with narcissists is it's their ego they have a really unhealthy sense of self it's generally it, it's so fragile that they overcompensate for it and so what we see it as arrogance we might even see it as confidence but it's really arrogance it's like this just this really insecure ego that continually just needs to get fed and to prove to themselves that they're okay and all of this. And so this, okay, the reason like why religion and therapy and a lot of this stuff doesn't work is because in order for that to work, a person needs to be able to submit, like they need to be able to surrender and say, like if, if they're going to find God, like finding finding God's only part of it, but it's, it's the submission to God that changes a person's life. You know, it's being like, you know, God work, you know, I'm here, put me to work, like work through me. Who do I need to become in order for, for you to work through me? Change me, right? Narcissists won't do that because their ego won't let them. And it's the same thing with therapy. When you're in therapy, you're, you've got to be vulnerable. You've got to be like, here's what's not working in my life. And here's my, here's, Blah. like here's everything right here's all of the parts of me that i feel shame and embarrassment about and a person has to have a, a relatively healthy ego in order to risk being vulnerable like that and narcissists and sociopaths won't do that they don't see solutions oriented people tend to see vulnerability it's as the foundation of connection right so if i if you show me all of the parts of yourself that you've are ashamed of and that you feel are ugly and unlovable, a, a, a reasonably healthy person will see that and we feel compassion. We're like, oh, those are all of your ugly parts. Like here's all of mine too, right? Like, and it, bo it helps bond us because you sense that pain. You're like, I know what it's like to have these parts of, of yourself that you feel shame about. And now I love you even more because you showed me these ugly parts of you. And I just, I think, I just think you're, you're like, thank you for sharing that with me. And I just, I see more of who you are and you're even more beautiful to me because of that. Right. But for them, they don't see vulnerability that way. They see it as a sign of weakness, like something to be destroyed. This is why we were talking at like, you know, three hours ago about Lucy and Charlie Brown. So if you're opening up to somebody and you're like, you know, when you say this, this really hurts me and this, that, and the other they instantly set up, set up walls and they're like, this is, dis and you'll see it on their face. There's this contempt and disgust and hostility of like, ah, oh, you're too sensitive. This is disgusting. This is, you're weak. I don't want to talk about this. You just need to suck it up. This, they become defensive when other people show vulnerability. That's a huge problem. Like there is no getting through to anybody. There's no getting through to anybody when their defenses are up. Any one of us. But when you're dealing with the person who's like, whose wiring is twisted, like 
<laughs> you know, this is why you start getting a lot of this stuff where they uh, can, they put on, they're just so used to putting on performances because uh, there is no like healthy sense of self that can actually risk being seen. And that's a good point too. Truth Seeker says, yes, they project their own weaknesses as yours. And that's another level of crazy making. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll up. James says, yeah, and therapists don't catch any of it. Well, I think the hard part is like, if, because manipulation is not, it needs to be its own class for mental health professionals. It really does. And <laughs> if a person, if, you know, a therapist, a mental health professional of any kind is going to as generally assume that another person is there because they really want to be there and that they want to change and that they uh, are being, they're taking them at face value until things stop adding up. Like if a person, you know, if, if they've seen them for a few sessions and you're like, yeah, you know, or maybe if it's really bad, like right away, we're like, this person is blown smoke or they're very grandiose or they're delusional or they're like the, the certain things that are registering um, that were, the, if depending on how familiar they are with the stuff, they're going to start being like, you know what, there's this, this the disconnect here between how this person sees themselves and how, and the, how others see them and how they like live their life. Like this is a problem, but if you have a therapist who really falls into like, you know, communication solves everything um, kind of a thing. And they're not able to spot manipulation for what it is. And they give other people the benefit of the doubt and kind of all of this, then yeah, it's not, nobody's going to get very far with stuff like that. So And that's a problem. And James says, yes. And then um, with his ex telling him how he feels. And so that's a great way to tell if a person or if we, if either we or somebody else is projecting is if we're telling other people or if we're being told what we think or feel, that person's projecting because nobody knows how another person thinks or feels because we're not them. So we might have an idea kind of based on their behavior of you seem to are, you know, you seem like you're upset or you seem confused or you seem this way. But for me to tell you, you know, you're obviously very upset or you're, you're feeling um, hurt or you're thinking uh, that you want to leave me like this kind of stuff. Like, well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, who, like, <laughs> we don't know. Like they, they know because we're not in their head and vice versa. Oh, that's crazy making. Nikki says, yeah, my ex always said, why do you take my word so literally whenever he got caught lying? Yeah, oh, that's just a bunch of word salad is what that is. That's uh, gives me a headache just thinking about it. A bunch of nonsense. That's a very valid point. I want to know, says therapists don't realize that for CPTSD, for CPTSD healing to take place, the experience must be validated and seen by the therapist. Yeah, I think that's a big first step is a person just having their experience validated. Like this is a problem. This wasn't right and this wasn't fair and this was crazy making and how everything that you're feeling is your it's totally normal 
given such an extremely abnormal situation that you went through. And it's like going through an emotional meat grinder. And yeah, feeling dysregulated, feeling like you've been, your life has been blown into a million different parts. Like all of that's very normal. Doesn't mean just because it's normal doesn't mean that you should somehow be able to tolerate it all by yourself. It just means that how you're feeling is normal. So like, let's figure out a plan to get all of those pieces put back together again. So... Ah, sorry, timer is done. Um, James, okay, you bring up a great point. James says, yeah, this one time his ex said, I know this man, I know what he's thinking and going to say. So this is the, the kind of stuff that I see a lot with really problematic people and especially like new age movement um, where they're confusing psychic ability with like uh, uh, their own defense mechanisms. So like projection and um, transference basically probably being like the main two. So oh, I, I guess that, and I've seen this a lot. There's a lot of new age speakers out there that are like, I'm psychic. I am, um, you know, I'm intuitive. I, I they have all of these abilities. I'm clear sentient. I'm clear audience. I'm clear, you know, da, 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 all of these different, I have all of these powers and I'm just so special, unique and different. And um, I just know everything on every single level <laughs> right? on this planet and others. Like I just galaxy wide, I just know everything. And that kind of stuff is a problem. And so I even get concerned to people when they're talking about being empaths and they're like, yeah, I'm really highly in tune with other people. I was thinking about this today. I think we have to be really careful about how, like not projecting our own emotional stuff onto other people or like trans transference, like thinking, you know, either putting our own stuff on other people or thinking or being triggered by another person's stuff and then making it our own. And this happens, it flies under our, a person's radar. So we're not even really aware that this is going on. It takes a lot for that to be brought to the surface, but that kind of stuff, like being like, I know, and sometimes weird things do happen, right? We have those deja vu moments or we're like, oh, I knew that person was gonna say that. But more often than not, that's just coincidence. You know, if it can't be duplicated with any degree of like, you know, consistency, then it's coincidence. So it's, it's that kind of stuff is, I think, more um, um, a red flag than we give it credit to. A lot of people are running around being like, oh, I'm psychic and I do this and I do that. And I'm, you know, so in tune and this, that, and the other, and they're, they're just projecting and transferring all of their stuff. And, um, and then if, I mean, it's scary, right? And it's tragic because then you've got people that are making like major life decisions based off of what another person says because they're like, oh yeah, I'm psychic. I, I know all of these things. And like, they're just saying words. And now another person, they've decided to move across the country or they've decided to not get medical help because a psychic told them that they didn't need to. This stuff can get real problematic real fast. So it's not, it's so, it's just so important that we're grounded within ourselves and that we know how to think critically about what we're experiencing. I would love, yes. And the seeker says it's confirmation bias. Yes. That kind of a situation where we're like, oh, I knew, I knew they were going to say that it's, it's selective bias and it's confirmation bias. So there, there might've been 10 other times, uh, psychics will do this, right? Like there's, they, it's interesting like if you go back and like watch the different reels of, of different psychics, like they said 10 things that were misses, but then they hit on one thing and then everybody focuses on that one thing. And the psychics like, see, I knew it. I'm just super special, you know, unique and different. And I just knew it. And other people are like, see, they do it. 
And it's like, no, what they're unintentionally, maybe, or intentionally, if they're really con artists, but what they're doing is they're um, like tapping into cold reading. Like if they're really emotionally in tune with people and if they're not aware that they're like filtering out information on the fly and then they're just cherry picking like the results that they want and then saying like, oh, I, this is somehow proof of something. Like it's not, it's, I don't know, James Randi. <laughs> Like, if you're not familiar with him, go find him on YouTube. I absolutely adore him. He's wonderful and um, did a lot of work with psychics and cold reading and um, confirmation bias and all kinds of stuff like this. Just fantastic. Sam was talking about his coworker and was saying, yeah, this has been an ongoing situation and they were doing a project together. And then it sounds like she was interested in him and then he wasn't interested in her. And then now she's just been kind of making, making his life a living hell at work. And he was, the goal was going to be to kind of like distance himself and try to not like detach from doing the project with her was my understanding and um and it says he says that she's still trying stuff and i would i would anticipate that she continues like she's obviously got some sort of like ego injury going on and again like you're you're dealing with a person's defense mechanisms and those like are going to stay up for quite a while so if they ever soften around you, so it's just disengaging from that as much as possible because oh, it's just crazy making. Right, that's a great point, Gareth. Gareth says, yeah, it's the same as when somebody says, oh, okay, I was just thinking about you when you called. And it's like, well, yeah, but how many times have you thought of me and I haven't called? Exactly. That's a great example. Exactly, exactly. But we tend to discount all of that because we it was a fleeting thought, right? Like how many times do I think about my brother and he actually calls? There's been many times I've thought about him and he hasn't called. Now, if he calls right now, I will be pretty weirded out, but <laughs> more often than not, he does not call when I think about him. Okay. That's a great point. So New Life says, yes, I'm an empath, but I do wonder when I feel for someone else, whether it's really how the other person is feeling or if it is just how I would feel in their position. Yes, I think it's, it's more often than not how we would feel in their position. So, because we don't know how a person feels unless we ask them. I think that's the danger of, us thinking like, oh, I'm so in tune with other people's pain. Um, I think more often than not, what we're really saying is, I'm so in, I, I'm so in tune with this pain, right? Meaning, like we've experienced something similar that I'm, I feel this compulsive need to try to avoid to help other people to not experience that. So here's, a, here's an example of that, like kind of on a lighter, well, I don't know if it's really lighter. And after we had the house fire in May, you know, both of our cats were in the house and they both went to the emergency vet. And we had one cat that was in critical care for a week. And the other cat, and the whole time I was just so heartbroken. We, Travis and I both, because they're brothers. And we're like, oh my goodness, they've never been away from each other before. And this is the other cat, they must be missing each other. And oh, this is, we should bring the other cat to visit the, I thought we might have even brought the other cat to visit the other one. I don't even remember. And we were, had worked up this whole story about how these cat, this brotherly love and this connection that they had and how heartbroken they would, because they normally, 
they get along like brothers. <laughs> they either get along really well or they're fighting. But, uh, and then it turned out that wasn't the case at all. Like the one cat was super cuddly all by himself. He was a very different cat away from his brother. And then when his brother came home from the hospital, they were hiss. It was like they were strangers. They were hissing at each other, and we were scared to leave them alone. That they were just going to attack each other. So I, we both had put like all of this. We created this whole narrative around, you know, um, what it must be like for them, because we were projecting our own stuff of like we were transferring our own stuff of like what it would be like, what we would think it would be like, but not, not true. I have not. J Gareth says, Dana, have you seen Red Dog? Yeah, I don't know. No, I have not seen that. Yeah, up here says that one cat smelled the vet on the other. I, that's what I was thinking too. It was like, uh, that was probably a big part of it. Okay, let's see. Did I miss... That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Missouri Cowboy says, yeah, projection is interesting from both aspects, the narcissist using it to abuse and the target using it to say, to stay ensnared. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, but yeah, I think so back to like us having empathy, you know, I think it's, I think the part of it is just being a normal, decent person. Like if you see somebody else in pain, even though we might be assigning a lot of our own feelings to them, like how we think it would feel to be in a hospital bed or to be alone or to be scared or all of this kind of stuff, uh, I think that's just part of having like empathy in general, but I do think it's so important that we make sure to, if we care about other people to ask them how, how they're feeling instead of just assuming that we know. Um, because also too, like what, this was a big thing for me to realize. And I don't know if I really fully realized it until recently, but um back when I was working at a domestic violence shelter, before I had gone through all of my own stuff, that was one of the things I couldn't figure out. It was very strange for me because I'd been in caregiving professions pretty much my whole life. And I'd worked with people with a wide variety of health challenges. A lot of people that were nonverbal, like Alzheimer's patients or um, autistic children or autistic adults or uh, developmentally disabled adults. So people with like a wide variety of ways that they would communicate. And I, I always felt like I did a really good job of like connecting with people that weren't able to articulate what was going on with them. And um, until <laughs> I got to the domestic violence shelter and then it was a totally, I was shocked as to how um, distant people were. And it, it hurt my feelings for quite a while because I was like, I was being treated like I was the enemy and people were very standoffish and um, didn't want to open up, didn't want to talk to me, didn't, I had one lady, um, and this also, I should add that the uh, shelter was on, um, uh, it was in New Mexico, it was on the outskirts of an uh, Indian reservation. And so we had, had one woman who didn't want me touching her children. Um, she just didn't trust white people in general. And so just different dynamics like that, where I, I just felt so helpless. I'm like, I don't know how to help here. Like, I don't know how to get through. And every tool that I had in my toolkit that had worked for the previous, you know, 20 years up to that point was completely ineffective. And I was at such a loss and it wasn't until like, and it was the thing too, like 
the skill set that I had where I would try, I would double up my efforts to let people know that I was safe. All of the ways that I had communicated, you can trust me to other people had the exact opposite effect. And now I get why. Because if, if obviously, right, like if you've been abused by somebody who's come across as um, friendly and personable, and if they've um, kind of um, been too warm and fuzzy, right, they've made too much of an effort to try to get you to feel safe, that's going to come across as insincere. Even though my intention was sincere, I was going about it in the wrong way that was registering as a problem for other people. So like what, I guess the point being what I thought was helpful and how I knew how to give help was not what they found helpful and not what they needed. And I didn't, it didn't dawn on, I, I would have been much more successful had I just asked instead of assumed that I somehow know best. That's the point of that story. Okay, Fallon, we'll do your question and then we'll go into our um, kind of a guided meditation thing, okay? So Fallon says, Dana, I'm so thrilled I got off work in time for your live stream. Please help me with anxiety revisiting my old town where I met my ex. He still lives there and I haven't visited in eight months. I don't know if I'm ready. That's a great question. Um, I think sometimes it can help uh, to think about what it is exactly that's giving us and what's giving you anxiety. So is it the thought of running into him? Is it the thought of seeing certain places? Uh, is it the thought of how you might handle that? The more of a plan that you have in place of, okay, this is how I'm going to respond, not react, but respond if you can, right? Because sometimes if you were to bump into somebody or something were to happen, a person can just freeze and then they might not handle a situation like they would ideally want to handle it. But if you can kind of think through this of like, okay, this is where, you know, he used to hang out uh, when we were dating. And so the, I'm, these are the places I'm just not going to go to. Like, there's no point in risking that. Um, so just steering clear of certain places, pre excuse me, preparing yourself emotionally if you do run into him of you're just going to take a deep breath. You're going to get up. You're going to excuse yourself. You're going to go to the bathroom or you're going to check your phone. Um, you're going to try. It's okay to get upset by it, but you're just going to try to stay cool, calm, and collected. Um, you're going to, maybe it might help to steer into a little bit of that anxiety and just realize the reason that I'm feeling this anxiety is because my inner self, my inner wisdom knows that this person is causes me pain and it's my inner self trying to keep me safe. So the way that I'm feeling is, is actually a good thing because it's, it's my inner self trying to keep me safe. And so I think to me, in a way like trying to make friends almost with that anxiety, it's there to protect you. It's there for a reason. It's appropriate that you feel that way. And maybe doing things while you're there. I don't know how long you're planning on staying there, but, um, you know, if you're going to be in town for like the, I don't know, a few hours or a weekend or what have you of kind of making sure you've got support before you go during your trip and then after you come back. So it might be talking, if you have a therapist, talking to your therapist about it before, during, and after. It might be, uh, kind of coming to different live streams like this or being in a support group and, and just kind of, um, or it might be journaling, kind of just getting in touch with these feelings and just realize like this is all very normal and to feel this way and um, you can handle it. And maybe telling it, reminding yourself, just reminding yourself, like I can handle this, I can handle this, I can handle this. 
If I see him, I can handle it. I can go to the bathroom. I can get on my phone. I can get up and leave. I, if he comes and approaches me, like, here's how I'm going to handle this. You know, it's okay. This person is not in my life. They're in my past. So all of, and they're not going to ever be in my life again. I, I can handle this. I know how to keep myself safe. That's a great way to put that. Leah says, I try to be the person that my 10-year-old self would need. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Malta, for the live stream donation. She says, thank you for the tonight's discussion. Yes, you are so very welcome. Okay, let's see here. And, and maybe even doing some like different things that can ground you. There's a lot of guided meditations on YouTube that can help. I'm trying to think of what else is out there. Um, that can help reduce anxiety. I would say the guided meditations is is always a good thing. Like there, there's like I said, there's a lot of them out on YouTube. So. Um, you have quite a choice. So that, that could be something that you could listen to with your phone, with your headphones at night before you go to bed, when you're in the car, uh, if you're out walking around in public, you know, uh, you could just turn on some like relax, relaxing music, these kinds of things. Okay, so with that said, guided meditation stuff, let's do our guided meditation stuff. So if you are driving, um, if you want, you might want to pull over, uh, or if you are at home, you might want to take some time to get comfortable, find a good spot. You can either sit or lay down, whatever is the most comfortable for you. Just take some time to be fully present in our body. Take some deep breaths in through your nose. And out through your mouth. Settling in to your body, being fully present in this moment. Feeling the weight of your body as you allow yourself to relax. Turning your attention inward, listening to your heartbeat. Feeling your heart beat deep in your chest. Really turning in to that feeling. See if you can bring awareness to feeling your pulse as that blood moves easily and effortlessly through your body. Feeling that pulsing sensation in both of your arms. And in your neck. And if you can, possibly down into your legs. fully present in your body. Realizing that this time is for you. You are fully present in this moment. 
not thinking about the future, not dwelling on the past. You are here in this moment. In this moment, you are safe. You are grounded within yourself. And continuing to breathe. Now bringing your attention to the top of your forehead. Relaxing any muscles that might need to be relaxed. Allowing any tension, pain or anxiety to dissipate, just to evaporate off of you. Relaxing your eyes and your eyebrows. Relaxing your cheeks and your jaw. Allowing your jaw to fall open and letting your tongue fall from the roof of your mouth. And relaxing your neck and your shoulders, allowing your shoulders to drop down, feeling the heaviness of your arms as you begin to relax. Relaxing your forearms, your arms, your wrists, your hands, and your fingers, allowing your hands to fall into whatever position is the most comfortable for you. And allowing your chest to fall open, continuing to breathe. Relaxing your chest. Reminding yourself that you are here, that you are safe. Notice how it feels as you unclench any muscles that you might have been previously clenching. Allowing your chest to relax, your stomach to relax, relaxing your hips and allowing your legs to fall into whatever position is the most comfortable for you. Relaxing your thighs and your calves and your feet and allowing your feet to fall into whatever position is the most comfortable. And continuing to breathe. Now let's visualize a backpack that you're carrying. And that backpack is stacked with one pound weights. 
And these weights represent all of the stress and anxiety that you've been carrying around. And now that you realize, oh, this is in a backpack. And you know what? I can set this down. And realizing that you can set this backpack down and you can keep it in a place where you see it. And that it's okay to set it down. It's okay to relax. It's okay to smile. It's okay. It doesn't negate anything that you went through. It doesn't mean that you're somehow okay with what happened. It doesn't mean that the pain or anxiety isn't there. It just means that it's in a backpack and you can set it down and you can pick it back up again when you want. But for now, let's just set that backpack down and let's visualize a really wonderful healing waterfall. That's just has the most magnificent, beautiful water that's just effortlessly and just peacefully. It's kind of spraying out from it. It's like a light mist that's surrounding it. Perhaps this waterfall is a beautiful silver color. It's unlike anything you've ever seen before. So after you put your backpack down, let's move closer to that waterfall. And as you get closer to it, you realize that as you move through it, this waterfall is going to wash away or it has the ability to wash away any pain or anxiety or tension that you're holding on to that you're ready to release much like caked on mud that's on you. And as soon as that water starts hitting you and falling over you, it's just a relaxing experience. And these unpleasant things just easily and effortlessly fall away. So let's move forward into that waterfall, allowing that healing purifying, calming water to just easily and effortlessly wash away anything that we're, that's ready to let go. And go ahead and feel that now as you walk forward. Letting that water cascade over you. moving over the top of your head, down your back, easily and effortlessly. And as you come out on the other side, noticing how much lighter you feel. And having the realization that, oh my goodness, that so much of this pain and anxiety is still back in that backpack and that you can move forward without much of what's in that backpack. And so you might decide to stay on this side of the waterfall for a while, just enjoying this new found sense of freedom and lightness. That here you're safe and that you can play and that you can smile that all these things are still available to you. They really, really are. That many, many of your best days are still ahead of you. So let's take some time to turn inward, just acknowledging to yourself how far you've come, how much you've learned, how strong and courageous you really are. There are so many things that are right about you. There really are. Perhaps visualizing giving yourself a big energetic hug. You are on your side. 
there is so much that is right with you. And you are, you're being that person that you, that your inner 10 year old needs. You can care for yourself, that you can soothe yourself, that you can validate yourself and that you can appreciate yourself. And when you're ready, let's go ahead and open your eyes. So thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. And we are going to be here tomorrow for book club. So I hope to see you guys there, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, And yes, so book club tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will see you then. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. And as always, lots of love to you guys. You are not alone. You are not crazy. And you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care. Talk to you later. Good night.